So what he's saying here is, um, in a way, um, if you must guess, right, have a reason for your guess, right? Then don't just guess wildly, right? Okay. Now notice, huh? If I try to imagine your your parents' home or something, right? Then I have no reason to say that your parents' home is two stories or a ranch or whatever, right? You know. So it'd be kind of just purely imaginative in my part, right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't have any reason for guessing one rather than another, right? That would be a, a wild guess instead. Mm -hmm. Pure guess, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But in the sense he's saying here, let's have a reason for our guesses, right? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, if we can get more than a guess, um, knowledge, that's even better, obviously. Mm -hmm. But let us at least begin mm -hmm. with a, a reasonable guess, right? Okay. And if we do some philosophy of nature sometime in another course, um, we look at the fragments, you know, of the natural philosophers that come down to us. And when I teach those, I say, now, uh, we're looking for at least reasonable guesses that these men are making, right? And the reason why what they say, they might have for saying what they say, right? And uh, notice, in most cases, a uh, uh, man uh, guesses the truth before he what? Knows it, right? Even in the easiest sciences for us, like geometry, yeah? um, the geometry would tell you that he guesses that something is true before he finds the reason why it must be so. And you know, if in these simple terms of geometry, like you know, have an isosceles triangle, uh, you would probably guess that the angles at the base of the isosceles triangle are what? Equal, right? Or in an equilateral triangle, I would guess that the what? angles would be all equal, <laughs> even before the rigorous proof is found, right? I wouldn't look for the reason why those angles must be equal if I had not already, what? Yes, yes, it was true, right? <laughs> so, um, in man's thinking, apart from those things that we kind of naturally come to know, like the axioms and their parts, we tend to guess the truth before we know it, right? And sometimes a reasonable guess is as far as we what? Get, right? Yeah. Okay. I might mention there that um, in the Greeks, huh, the Greeks uh, found two common arts of guessing. And one is called dialectic, huh? and the other is called what? rhetoric, right? You found two arts of guessing. Huh? And dialectic is an art of guessing about general questions. And rhetoric is in part, though there's other parts to it, but part of rhetoric is about guessing about the singular contingent. Who done it? <laughs> what should we as a country do? And so on. Um, so there are two arts of guessing, not of making wild guesses, but of making what? Reasonable guesses. Huh? And then, in modern times, we're all familiar with a number of arts of guessing that are more particular than dialectic or rhetoric. And so, um, the weatherman, for example, right? He has an art of what? Guessing the weather, right? You might say there's a 70% chance of rain tomorrow. Okay? He's guessing there's going to rain tomorrow, but he's obviously, what? doesn't know. <laughs> okay. And then the economist has an art of guessing what the economy's going to do, right? Okay. And uh, you read the interviews with, say, a top-notch economist in the U.S. News and World Report, and he'll say what the economy's going to do over the next few months, right? But there'll always be in there some phrase, barring unforeseen circumstances, <laughs> the population, da 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 <laughs> And uh, you, you see Merrill Lynch, you know, talking about, you can get their paper now on what the effect of the, the uh, Bush uh, tax uh, refund upon the economy, you know, the effect, you know, it gets what the effect is going to be, right? Mm -hmm. But no, see, people are paid to guess, huh? The weatherman is paid to guess, mm -hmm. the economist is paid to guess by industry or by government, right? 
And people are not paid for making wild guesses, huh? They're paid for making reasonable guesses, huh? Now, of course, um, you might you know, have a low opinion of the other man's art, huh? mm-hmm. but he has some basis for saying it's going to rain tomorrow or likely, you know, you know, you know expect some showers or something, right? Mm-hmm. He'll say. I know back home, you know, they used to have a contest in the day newspaper, you know, we could out, out guess the oh, yeah. weather man. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but what we call experimental science huh, is also involves guessing, right? But when Einstein speaks of the guess of scientists, which is an hypothesis, he says it's not a reasonable guess. He says that the guess of the scientist is freely imagined. Huh? So it's a wild guess. Again? Einstein, huh? Einstein. He says that the guess of the experimental scientist of the physicist, of himself, right? It's not a reasonable guess, right? Mm. It's a freely imagined guess. Huh? Okay. And therefore, uh, his guess has to be what? Tested, right? As it is by its consequences and so on, right? So you have something even weaker there than a reasonable guess, right? Hmm. Um, but a reasonable guess is something less than, than, than knowledge. Okay. So, reasoning then is coming to know or guess a statement from other statements and because of them, you have to see that in there, right? I'm not just going from these statements to those statements, but those statements you're coming to is because of the ones you first who are accepted. Huh? And sometimes a man will make a bunch of statements and say, and therefore, and then the conclusion emerges. <laughs> so he's just asserting that, right? <laughs> it doesn't really come out of huh? his uh, premises, right? Okay. Now perhaps you can define this or change the language a little bit differently here and say that reasoning is coming to know or guess a statement um, through other statements, huh? Okay. And then we could add a space of this in order to accept it, right? Yeah, that period again, too. From other statements known or accepted, huh? Is that same phrase there? Okay. So reasoning is coming to know or guess a statement from other statements already known or accepted, right? And because of that, right? Okay. Or reasoning is coming to know or guess a statement through other statements, right? Okay. Already known or accepted, huh? Okay. So you don't add the whole phrase. Kind of understood there, right? Okay. So that's what reasoning is. Huh? Now, calculating is something like that, but calculating is what? Coming to know, I guess, a number. A number. From, from other numbers. numbers, right? Okay, or from other numbers, right? Now, someone might say, why do you use the word guess there when you talk about calculating? Is it adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing? Isn't that a rather rigorous thing, right? Well, that's true. But even if you add or subtract or multiply or divide correctly, the number you get, you may still be only a guess. Why? Either you started with numbers that were... Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So when we sit down, let's say, to calculate how much uh, it's going to cost out there or something, right? Or how much, uh, you know, it's going to cost us for, for this dinner, right? Huh? Okay. And so maybe we have the number of guests who are going to be coming to dinner, right? 
And then we have to multiply that by the number of, of beers per guest, let's say, right? Okay. So I can multiply the number of guests that I have, I think they're going to come, right? And the number of beers on average that each guest will drink, right? And multiply those numbers very correctly. And yet, am I sure the number I get? No. Because some guests might not show up, right? Yeah. Or there might be some uninvited <laughs> guests, right? Uh, so they might get sick, whatever, right? Something, get something coming. And they might be particularly thirsty that night because of the hot night, or, <laughs> you know, or they might be abstemious, right? They might take the plunge or something knows. <laughs> and uh, so the numbers I multiplied, I wasn't sure about, right? No? I mean, calculating, calculating, we'll see, is, is a bit like the syllogism. In the syllogism, the conclusion follows necessarily from the premises. But, if you're not sure about the premises, the conclusion is not what? Something you can be sure about, even though it follows necessarily from that. Right? Okay. So, um, in order to be sure of the conclusion, you'd have to both be sure of the statements of which you reason, and the conclusion would also have to follow necessarily. Okay? And it's possible to have one of those without the other. Right? Now sometimes, um, I guess, though, due to the fact that even though your statements might be true, or you might even be sure about them, the conclusion doesn't follow what? Necessarily from them, right? Because it's not really no, we get a soldiers in there, right? Okay. So, I've got a little idea of what reasoning is now. I sometimes say to my colleagues, you know, even in philosophy, I say now, do you, you try to get students to reason in their class? And they say, yeah. And I say, what is reasoning? Yeah. And even people, you know, teaching philosophy, they don't have any definition of reasoning, you know? They really not thought out distinctly what reasoning is. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. And notice this here does say more what clearly and distinctly what reasoning is than the word reasoning does, right? Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I kind of like to use the word coming more, you know, because you can use the word knowing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's coming to know or guess a statement, right? From and because of, right? Other statements already known or accepted. Right? I know a little bit what reason is. Huh? Now, is an argument the same thing as reason? Huh? tools that we're studying in logic are speeches, right? So, okay. Okay. so argument is speech bringing together the statements from which we're going to uh, reason, right? So it's speech bringing together the statements from which we reason. Now the statements from which we reason, as we maybe said in the text I haven't mentioned in class here, the statements from which we reason are called the what? Premises. Huh? And I'm kind of stubborn. I have to use spell the word premise that way, but a lot of people want to spell it with uh, P R M I S C, right? But I got attached to premise, so. Okay. Oh. <coughs> premise reminds me too much the premise of the property, right? Oh. <laughs> but I always spell it premise, P R E M I S S. You see, sometimes people spell it P R E M I S 
at sea, right? Mm -hmm. I probably get minority. I don't know one, but <laughs> some of the minority, right? Okay. And the statement to which you reason is called the what? Conclusion, right? Okay. What is the sense of the word premise? Well, um, <clears throat> the Latin word premise, huh? Um, is used to translate the Greek word uh, from taxis, huh? Or for taxis, no, for team, for team. The Greek word has a sense of stretching forward, right? Yeah. The, the Latin word has a sense of what? Uh, sent yeah. before, right? Yeah. But the Greek word, in a sense, is more accurate, huh? Mm -hmm. For taxis is the Greek word. For premise, oh. huh? For taxis, huh? But it comes, I think, from the word proteina, which means to uh, stretch forward, right? So the premises huh, not only come before the conclusion, right? But they stretch yeah. forward, producing the what? <laughs> conclusion, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. um, notice in, in reasoning and in calculating, for that matter, which pertain to two different arts, huh? which the Greeks call logike and logistike, right? But they have a similarity, right? They're both arts for coming to know something you don't know, right? But we imitate nature. As Thomas says there, the premium, the logic, the nature premium, right? It reasons so far as possible, it imitates nature, right? Now, notice in nature, two dogs come together, male and female, and produce another what? Yeah. Two dogs don't come together and produce a, an elephant. <laughs> That's got to be unnatural, right? And two elephants come together, male and female, and they produce not a dog or a cat, but a what? Elephant, right? Mm -hmm. So when two statements come together, they produce what? Mm -hmm. Another statement, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So like the parents of that, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. And likewise, in calculating, when two numbers are added together or multiplied, however, you get another what? Number, right? Okay. As the British astrophysicist there, Sir Arthur Eddington, right, the head of the scientific team that confirmed the general theory of relativity, right? And he says, you know, if you put in numbers, what do you write out? More numbers. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, that's natural, right? Imitating nature, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. the, the offspring resemble the parents, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll see another likeness there, too, that um, just as in the sexual reproduction, its true parents huh, are enough to produce a third one, right? So, in the most exact reasoning, all you need is two statements to produce mm -hmm. a, what? Third statement, huh? Mm -hmm. And in the syllogism, you'll see that, right? Mm -hmm. the syllogism. You have just two premises, and they produce a third one, right? And notice, you need at least two numbers before you can add, or multiply, or divide, and so on, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the idea of two producing one is, is like this there. Yeah. Um, okay. So, argument then is speech bringing together the statements of which we reason. So what we're going to do now is to look at the main arguments, right? And this is the four kinds that we start talking about here on the second page. Now we're going to kind of enumerate these four kinds of arguments first, but towards the end of the, the, this paper or this, uh, these pages, we're going to divide the arguments, right? Okay, how you get the four, right? A couple ways you can divide it before, right? Okay. But it's, uh, I think, useful to first meet each one of the arguments by itself um, along the road which is natural to us, right? And that's the road from the senses into what? Reason, huh? So sometimes I draw that road on the <laughs> board for you. <laughs> okay? The road from the senses into reason, right? Now you notice that I draw on the road uphill, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And sensing is easy, right? But the further you go along the road, the more difficult it is. It's an uphill <laughs> uh, journey, right? Okay. And that kind of fits also the fact that you put the more universal above the less universal, right? And so a thing when sensed is like singular, as Waitie says, and when understood, it's universal, right? So the chair here that I see with my eyes, an individual chair, a singular chair, right? The chair that I can grasp and feel is singular, right? But when I understand what this is in front of me, this is a chair, right? I'm understanding something what? Universal. Because what a chair is, has gone into this chair and to other chairs, right? So a thing is singular when sense, and universal when understood. We talked about that a bit when we talked about the natural road, right? And therefore, those arguments that begin with something singular are more known to us, right? And they're easier for us, and they're closer to our senses, right? Okay. So the argument which the logician calls example, and the argument which the logician calls induction, these two kinds of argument begin from something singular. An example can be just one singular, right? Why the induction begins from what? Many singulars, right? Okay. So these two arguments come first, you might say, along the natural road. Huh? Okay. Now the last two arguments that we meet along the road, the nth to mean, and at the very top here, the syllogism, the nth to mean begins more from something universal usually not something quite universal, but something maybe is true for the most part, you know. But it's not so much starting from the singular, but more starting from the, the general, right? But the syllogism, as see, starts from something completely, what, universal. Okay. So in that sense, the syllogism is most into what? Reason, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about example, and then about induction, and then about enthymeme, and then about the syllogism, right? Which are these four kinds of arguments. Huh? Um, now let's start with the argument called example, huh? a very familiar argument. Huh? But the word example is equivocal by reason. Huh? And the first meaning we usually have in mind of example is not an argument at all, but it's a singular used to illustrate, right, the universal. Okay? So if I say, for example, I'm saying a glass is a uh, tool for holding liquid. For example, here's a glass, right, that you that you use, right? Okay? A chair is something to sit on for one person, etc. For example, here's a chair, right? Okay. That's not an argument at all. That's a singular used to illustrate the uh, universal. And this is necessary in all knowledge to use singulars to illustrate the universal because of our dependence upon the senses where our knowledge begins, right? Okay. And so the, if the professor talks about the universal without using the example, it's almost impossible for a student to understand. Okay. So it's a singular use to illustrate the universal. And it's very much like what we call the sample. You go into a great cheese store, let's say, right? Huh? You're going to buy a uh, wedge of cheese, you know, from this great big cheese they have there, right? But you wonder whether you want that big bit of cheese. And the guy gives you a what? Sample, right? Huh? Hmm, yeah, I'll take a quarter pound or half pound or whatever it is, right? Okay. The sample is a what? A piece, a part of the whole to indicate the quality of the whole, right? Okay. And then I buy wine, if the guy is going to give me a sample of his wine. Mm, you know? Okay. 
Uh, the difference between a sample and an example, though, is in the kind of hole you have. In the case of an example, the hole you're illustrating is what? Universal hole, right? Okay. I'm using this glass, this chair to illustrate what a chair is, right? Um, this piece of chalk to illustrate what a chalk is, right? And so on. By a sample, it's like a what? Integral hole, composed hole, right? Okay. I cut off a piece of that bigger pie, right? Yeah. Okay. I got a pie here. I want a piece of pie. Well, I don't know. Let me just a little sample. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. One <laughs> nice piece of the pie now, right? I can taste the sample, right? But the word sample and word example are etymologically connected, right? And see, Dion spoke of how good English was, right? <laughs> sometimes, you know, Dion would take the word in Greek, sometimes the word in Latin, and sometimes the word in English, right? Harry Irwin were in French. <laughs> but English has particular excellence, right? Does, does sample have a other meaning or just means the part of examples from sample? Yeah, I think sample is used more for the for the uh, integral or composed whole, right? Mm -hmm. And examples is more for the original whole, right? But they're similar, right? Using the part to illustrate the whole, right? Okay. Now we're going to use the word example here, though, as Aristotle does, for an argument. And this is an argument from one singular to another singular of the same what? Kind. Okay? So, it's an argument from one singular to another singular. You have to add the same kind, right? Now, of course, the strength of this argument <coughs> depends upon the likeness there between the two uh, singulars, right? And the more alike they are, right, the stronger the argument is, right? Okay. So when we buy something, we often use this argument, right? I bought a Plymouth and it lasted me ten years. Now I'm going to buy another car. I'm thinking I'm going to buy another Plymouth, right? Okay. My father-in-law saw how long my Plymouth did, so he went out and bought a Plymouth too, right? He got a lemon. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact that, you know, that past uh, <clears throat> Plymouth was good doesn't mean the next one necessarily be good, right? This is obviously an argument in which what, the conclusion doesn't follow necessarily, right? Okay. But if I had to, you know, um, now I have a Honda out there, right? Huh? Okay. And I said that a couple, a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah. I've had very good luck with the Hondas, right? You know, they start all through the winter, even if the car is not in the garage, you know, one car garage, and there are three cars there for my son and their wife, community car. And they always start in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. okay. I had a Chevrolet, and, you know, it's like it wouldn't start or something, right? So if I knew a Honda, right? Rather than another, what? Sure. Yeah. So, okay. Um, it's an argument from one singular to another singular, the same kind. But it depends, to say, upon the likeness between the two, right? One time, years ago, my wife and I went to Joseph's restaurant in Boston, which at that time never still exists, but great restaurant. We went there on a Saturday night and we had a dinner. And everything was marvelous, right? Even the potatoes, you could make a whole meal and the potatoes are so good. This looks delicious, right? So then, friend comes into town with a great connoisseur, he's been in Paris, and, you know, he wants to go to a really good restaurant in Boston, well, the only one I knew about was Joseph's, right? So he went to Joseph's on a Monday evening, right, he and I, and had a very, I would say, ordinary meal. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit after having, you know, recommended this, huh? Okay. And notice, I was proceeding, right, by this argument, right? Okay. But notice, huh? in retrospect, maybe the grand chef is there on Saturday night, <laughs> but Monday night is the, what, the hicks in the kitchen, right? <laughs> or something, right? Mm -hmm. See? Maybe if I had gone with my friend um, on another Saturday night, we would have had a more comparable meal, huh? even though that would not be necessarily so either, right? Mm -hmm. But the point is, you're more likely, huh? Mm -hmm. you see? Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
think this argument depends upon the likeness between the two, huh? Okay. Um, we're always using this argument without thinking about it, right? Okay. If you ask me a recommendation to a restaurant now, say, there's, let's say, two Chinese restaurants, you can go to a Chinese restaurant in town, and I've been to one of them and had a, a good meal, the other one had a lousy meal, right? And I tell you that, you probably go to the one where I had a good meal, right? You won't necessarily um, get the better meal there, right, than the other one. But this is a reasonable guess. There's a reason for this what? Yes, right? There's a reason why you're going to this restaurant, and that didn't simply put the coin, right? You see? They're using the past experience, right? Okay. Um, and this gives me the guess that we call suspicion, right? I suspect you have a better meal there than there, right? Here's let me tell you what happened, I went, you know, to two places, huh? Okay? And sometimes that's the best argument that we have, right? Okay. You want to know which restaurant to go to? That's the best argument I can give you, right? I had a good meal here, and I had a lousy meal there. So to go there, you get a lousy meal, you go here, you couldn't. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> so it's an argument from one singer to another side at the same time. Um, example here that I give from uh, Shakespeare's play, right? Henry V, huh? And this is uh, when the English are, this is set during the Hundred Years' War, right? When England invaded France a number of times. The war, you know, was not continuous, but it was lasted over a hundred years, right? And you had these famous battles, you know, like in Henry V, you had the battle of what? Agincourt, yeah? Okay. But there's an earlier battle, Years, huh? And so the English are preparing to come over, and the French king is what? Concerned, right? Okay. So he urges the nobility to prepare carefully for the second invasion in his lifetime, right, of the English. And this is the words of the king. It fits us then to be as provident as fear may teach us out of late examples, left by the fatal and neglected English upon our fields. Huh? So he remembers the last time the British came over, right? Huh? And they were not prepared for them, right? The neglected English, right? The fatal English, right? Mm -hmm. See? He knew the havoc that they think. And so now they're coming again, right? He realizes the need to be as best prepared as they can. See? Now the young dolphin, right, wasn't around the first time the English came. And of course, you know, what can those northerners do, you know, with us? Wine picking Frenchman, you know. <laughs> you see? He's overconfident, right? And you'll see that later on in the play, too, right? But the king has what? Experience, right? Yeah. Now notice this is an example of what Shakespeare says, huh? Looking before and after, right, huh? You're looking before what happened in the past in a similar case, and you're trying to foresee I mean you only guess, but trying to foresee what's going to be like when they come the second time, right? And notice the word that Shakespeare uses there, provident, right? Which is the Latin word for Foreseen. foresight, yeah. When Thomas takes up the virtue of, of uh, prudence, huh? prudentia, Latin, and he's giving integral parts of prudentia. And one of the integral parts of prudentia is providentia. And you know how he has objections in the Summa, right? One of the objections is um, Prudence and providence mean the same thing. So how can one be a part of the other, right? Mm -hmm. And that's etymologically ec true. If you go back and get a Latin dictionary, prudentia is a contraction of providentia. Mm -hmm. See? So the English translation for prudentia would be foresight, right? Mm -hmm. And Thomas says, well, the whole virtue is named from this part, because this is the principal part, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay? I notice in reading over the years, uh, so Winston Churchill, you know, mm -hmm. he'll tend to use the word foresight, right, rather than the word prudence, right? Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. And foresight is a better word to use, huh? Mm -hmm. so, but you, in a sense, foresee what coming after, right, mm -hmm. through looking before and seeing. Mm -hmm. So you're looking before and after, right? Mm -hmm. yeah? Um, yeah. um, we knew this spontaneously, you know, I've read a lot of accounts of of the time when MacArthur wanted to plan the, wanted to go through the Inchon landing, right? And uh, 
the Washington was not uh, was afraid of the Inchon Landing, you know, mm-hmm. and they sent the uh, chief of staff of the army and they sent the top admiral mm-hmm. to try to convince MacArthur not to do it, right, mm-hmm. or against it. And of course, I read you know two or three different accounts. People were present, so it's kind of mm-hmm. interesting because the chief of staff, you know, spoke against it, you know, and, mm-hmm. and the admiral spoke against it, you know. Mm-hmm. And then MacArthur got up there, but he's kind of nervous. What MacArthur going to do, you know? And uh, MacArthur says he's going to do exactly what Wolf did in Quebec, you know? Mm-hmm. And because it just strikes me so much, because you know what Wolf did, right? No one thought that Wolf could go up the river and mm-hmm. climb the hills and come up on the plains of Abraham. Mm-hmm. And he hit them exactly where they didn't expect him, right? Mm-hmm. And that led to the, what? Capture of Quebec, right? Mm-hmm. I'm going to do the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. It's automatically by right, going back like that, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. And seeing what Wolf did, right? Mm-hmm. So it was, it was a hazardous thing in some sense. Wolf did. He had to slip, you know, by the, the French there at night, you know, and then climb the hills, right? Mm-hmm. That seemed hardly climbable, right? But they found the way up, right? You know, and he tried to do the same thing, you know, mm-hmm. behind the enemy, and then <laughs> and you least expect him, right? Mm-hmm. Crack used to joke in later years, you know, hit him where they ain't. <laughs> That's the way of it. It's all got to right? But yeah. it's, it's the way of the strategy there. Um, that's another thing in Shakespeare, you know, anytime you get a little quote like this for one reason, like I you know, put this down for exemplifying, uh, in a vertical sense of example. Mm-hmm. Example, right? Exemplifying example. Two different senses of example there. But notice what Shakespeare says, as fear may teach us. It's interesting that fear is said to what? Teach us, huh? In, in uh, even the early, um, in the Adonis, right? The little animal is being chased by the other animal, right? And he's trying to escape. And uh, Shakespeare says, wit waits on danger. Wit meaning wisdom, huh? Mm. Yeah. It's fear uh, that makes us take what? Counsel, right, huh? Mm-hmm. Be careful, right? Wisely and slow, <laughs> they stumbled it went fast, as Friar Lawrence says. Kind of interesting, one of my friends there, yeah, from observed on see Dion for years, you know, says his predominant passion is fear. <laughs> and, uh, but that, you know, made him avoid all the kinds of mistakes that other thinkers made, you know, who didn't have that same fear of being mistaken, right? This, um, this Shakespeare's use of examples, mm-hmm. is, is he referring to the examples left upon the field? Are those the dead Frenchmen? Yeah, the haddock that the English you know, uh, worked the last time they were there. In fact, you know, the, the black prince there, right? Huh? The king went up on the hill there, right? With half of his troops, you know, and stood up there on the hill and watched his, his uh, son there, the black prince, right? You know, destroy the French, you know? Oh. <laughs> you know he had more than despair, right? Mm-hmm. Huh? So once you see that sort of thing, right, to say, I'm going to do everything we can to be prepared when the English come over mm-hmm. a second time. Huh? <clears throat> okay. So notice this kind of argument is used um, in rhetoric and particularly in political rhetoric. Huh? Where you're often arguing from the past to the future, right? You know, the most common example that they always give in modern times is they always go back to Munich, right? And where they tried to appease Hitler, right? You know? And uh, Chamberlain came back to England, you know, and you can see it in the documentaries, even, you know. I was, you know, you know, peace in our times, you know, when people are down there cheering. <laughs> and, and Churchill's saying, you know, you just don't have to fight them under what, less favorable <laughs> circumstances now, right? You know, each time they did. So when you I might say now, when we tried to appease the dictator Hitler, right, it didn't satisfy him, it just made it more voracious, right? Mm-hmm. So then they, you know, they will appeal to that when some other dictator is demanding something, right, and thinking, well, maybe if we give him this, we can avoid war, and, mm-hmm. you know, and it just makes it more, right, voracious, huh? Mm-hmm. But if you go back now, you know, to the, to the, the founding papers, like the Federalist Papers, right, then, you'll see they're using this argument called examples all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. They go all the way back to even to the Greeks, right? Mm-hmm. And the Greeks, you know, could not be liked, and they fought among each other, you know, the Peloponnesian Wars and so on. And if the 13 colonies don't unite, you know, we'll be eventually, what, 
falling out and bubbling over boundaries and fighting among okay. themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Or they would point to the you know, Union of England and Scotland and how the, the economic prosperity in Great Britain, right? And then they'll you know, argue the map to this, right? Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of arguments of this kind, for example, it's very common. Okay. Um, you know, if students at school, it's kind of interesting. If a student takes a course from a professor and gets a good mark, then he very often will take another course from that same professor. <laughs> well, if you took a course from a professor and got a low mark, right, you'll, you know, maybe not take it again, right? Huh? Okay. So, I mean, students are always passing information, you know, if the student liked the course, you know, then, okay, maybe you'll persuade his fellow student to take that course, right? Or if he hated the course, or it's too difficult, or, you know, you see. But you don't realize that they're using all the time this argument called what? Example, right? They're taking a past course and using that to judge in what? Future <coughs> course, right? Huh? Okay. Now, you, you, you know, now notice, you might like Professor X in this course and, and meet Professor X or <laughs> this course. Uh -huh. In this course, this other material, right? Huh? Yeah. It's more difficult material or something, right? Mm -hmm. But as I say, this argument depends upon the what? Likeness, right? Mm -hmm. Remember when I was first teaching, I had a student in logic, which is like the first course. And then next semester, so I had him in the philosophy of nature, right? And so I asked him how he liked the philosophy of nature course, and he said he liked it, but it was much different than the logic course, right? <laughs> but a different, a different uh, knowledge, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I mean, you know, you have two courses that are quite uh, different, yeah. yeah. I mean, if I'm teaching a course called Double Friendship, you know, you might have a over enrollment, right? The uh, problem is different. Okay? And, uh, but someone might love my love and friendship course, and then logic course, you know, <laughs> might not like that at all, right? <laughs> you see? So, I mean, it depends upon the what? The likeness of the two, right? Huh? You know? So, you say the same kind. The strength of this depends upon how much the two are alike, huh? You get these skeptics you now, like, which are historians, right? Huh? And, uh, you know, if you ever get a pure story, right, you're interested in the singular as singular, right? And they see the uniqueness of every historical period, right? And uh, this one historian that I knew very well, he said, um, you know, the purpose of history is, is to show the fallacy of all historical analogies. Oh. <laughs> see, you know, you only saw the differences between, you know, you see? But, uh, but that case, you know, you, you couldn't uh, use this in going to the restaurant, you, know, you know, going to buying a car, or, you know, you see. Um, okay, so you understand an argument then? You can call it an example, huh? Okay. I know how close that case to sense is. Huh? You reason from one singular to another singular, right? But usually, like a singular from the past. To a singular in the future, right? Okay, just staying on the level of the singular, right? Okay. Now, induction huh, is an argument from many singulars towards the what? Universal. Okay. So you're going much further along the road, right? You're going from the singulars to the universal, right? So induction is an argument for many singulars to the universal. Okay. So this is the frog and he's a three chambered heart and this frog and this frog and so on. I am progressing towards the statement that all frogs have a what? Three chambered heart, right? Yeah? Okay. Uh, sometimes they translate um, the uh, definition there of induction in Greek and Latin there as an argument going forward from the singulars towards the universal, right? And the going forward is taken from the going forward, the movement of an animal, right? So each singular, right? This frog is a three-chambered heart, this frog is a three-chambered heart, this frog is a three-chambered heart, right? 
And the more you go through, the more you advance to the statement that all thought is natural. And change your heart, right? So it's an argument for many singulars to the universal, right? Huh? No, when you say many singulars, you actually have statements. Singular statements. This student has two ears, this student's the universal statement that every student has two ears, right? <coughs> and since they're now constructed by senses, this is the way we get from the senses from uh, the senses to the universal statements that we need even later on in the case of the what? Syllogism, right? Now, um, does the conclusion follow necessarily in this argument, right? If I cut open a thousand frogs and each one has a three-chambered heart, can I conclude necessarily that all frogs have three-chambered hearts? No. But if I have a large number and I haven't seen an exception, right, I will certainly make the reasonable guess, right? Now, if this is the way we come to universal statements, some people jump to the conclusion, which is contrary to prior words as advice, right? Wisely and slow, they stumble and run fast, right? Mm -hmm. They jump to the conclusion and say that no universal statement is known. That every universal statement, whether affirmative or negative, right, is a what? A guess, right? Mm -hmm. It'd be a reasonable guess, but mm -hmm. it's still a guess. Well, if it was by induction alone that I knew this, right, uh, that would be reasonable, right? But is it by induction alone that I know that every whole is more than its part? So I come to the statement, every whole is more than its part by seeing holes in their parts, right? So I come to it by induction, but I come to it by induction alone. Right? So in the case of whole and part, I think I understand what a whole is what a part is, so that I can see that a whole must be more than one of its parts, right? Because a whole is something that is composed of parts, right? It has parts, huh? And, um, but notice, if you take something like snow is white, right? Okay. I don't understand what snow is enough, or what white is enough, to see that snow must be white. See, I might say that all snow is white on the basis of induction alone, right? Okay. But I wouldn't say that no odd number is even on the basis of induction alone, right? Mm -hmm. So though we do come to all universal statements by induction, in some cases we understand enough about the, the parts, right? To say that it must be so. Okay. Um, and that's what's overlooked, right? See? Okay. <clears throat> Notice the word induction there, right? It's a Latin word, right? And the Greek word that is used to translate epigoge is the same etymology. It's say what? A leading in, right? Okay. So you're leading somebody into the universal statement through the what, singular statements, right? You're leading them into a universal whole in a way through the what, subject parts, right? Okay. And if you look at the word introduction, which is like the Greek word pisagoge, right? It also has that basically the same etymology. It's a leading what? In, right? But an introduction um, to some science, you're being led into the whole science from some parts of that science, right? So it's more like the composing parts, right? In a way, I'm giving an introduction to logic. We're not seeing the whole of logic, right? Huh? But we are seeing certain parts of logic, right? And so you're being led into the whole from the parts, right? So there's a likeness between introduction and induction. They're not the same thing, right? And uh, you would know it from etymology, but I mean, 
the similarity, right, is that in both cases you're being led into the whole for the parts. But in one case it's a universal whole, induction. In the other case it's more a composed whole, right? Okay. Um, the word uh, mentioned earlier in the course there, metaphor and uh, translation, right? We have the same etymology, one in Greek, one in Latin. Carried over, right? But in the case of translation, you carry over not the word, but the meaning. <laughs> in the case of metaphor, you carry over the word, not the meaning. <laughs> but as far as the etymology is concerned, there's no reason why it could be reversed, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in a way, induction and introduction have almost the same etymology, but but induction is used for leading one into the universal whole from the part, and introduction more for the composed whole, right? Okay. Um, I also make a comparison there to the word inducement, which is now uh, addressed more to the will or to the emotions than to the reason, right? What's an inducement? Huh? So I'll take the example there, the, the economic example. Where the guy says, you know, well, if you buy this car, I'll build a new pair of tires or something, right? <laughs> he, he's trying to what? Induce you, lead you into accepting this car, right? Okay. Uh, but it doesn't force you to buy the thing, does it, right? But it, it does, in a way, what? Climb a bit, right? He's a little push in that direction, right? Mm -hmm. He sees you kind of hesitating, you know. Um, to throw this in, you know, or, you know, how about a, you know, a stereo or something, you know, you know something to throw in, you know, it's a kind of special, you know, okay. But that, that in a sense, fits in Dutch too, because it's not, you know, like a forest, right? Okay. Do you have the armor too, induction? Induced? Yeah. Again, the parts are becoming, you're getting into the whole, right? the whole arm. That's something that makes sense, huh? so appreciate the word. Huh? Okay. I notice the difference between example and induction. In a way, the example goes from part to part. Huh? It goes from a singular, one singular to another singular, right? Uh, sometimes you use the word particular in place of singular, right? So you see it's an argument from one particular to another particular of the same kind, right? By induction, sometimes we'll say it's an argument from many particulars to the what? To the general. So it's more like going from the part to the whole. For example, it's going from part to part. Right? Now, the nth it's interesting um, how um, in English now the names that we have in English for these four arguments, two of them come from what? Latin, and two of them come from what? Greek, right? As if the Latins didn't have a name for the last two arguments, right? And so they took over the Greek word, right? All right, for the first two, they have a native, what, Latin word, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, if I go, that's kind of a sign, right, of the difficulty. The Greeks were the teachers of the Romans. Huh? Uh, a man learned in grammar, you know, explained to us one time, you know, how the Greeks um, figured out the grammar of the Greek language. And the Romans couldn't figure out the grammar of their own language. But they learned from the Greeks something about the Greek grammar, and they saw we had some things like that in Latin. And then the things they couldn't find like in the Greek, they just kind of tacked on to the <laughs> things. And that's why the, the cases, you know, nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, ablative, are all screwed up in Latin, right? They don't fit the language. But in Greek, the case is in exactly right order to fit the language. And then he said, we English people, we, we borrow the Latin grammar and try to imitate that, right? 
rather than you know thinking through our own language. Huh? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, Greeks are superior. And the Greek, you know, dramatists they learn the drama from the Greeks, right? And the Romans, you know, philosophy they have is kind of borrowing from the Greeks. Huh? Well, it's kind of interesting here on logic, right? That the Greeks, right? Had the four arguments, right? The names which they thought out in their language, right? The Romans, they just broke down at this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they just wrote the Greek words, right? You know? Okay. We're in, you know, we're in the Now, enthymeme is, is kind of obscure, the, the etymology of the word. Um, it's got in, en, and then thumas, right? Now thumas, the time you get to Plato and Aristotle, thumas has a sense of, of anger usually, right? Or courage, right? Then. But if you go back earlier in the Greek, thumas has a sense of the uh, mind, huh? okay? So in thumas means in the mind, right? Okay? And in a way, it's well named because you're starting from something that is not what? often singular, but something that is what? More universal, or almost universal, something that is in the mind, right? Huh? Okay. And uh, a second thing that people sometimes notice about the enthymeme, that when a, a speaker uses an enthymeme, um, he often doesn't uh, state the universal aspect, right? If he thinks that the audience will what? I think I understand it. Yeah, they'll, they'll yeah. supply that, right? Huh? Okay. Um, let's see some examples of that right here from Shakespeare. Now, let me uh, raise it here a second to define the infinite. Enthymeme is defined as an argument from likelihood or signs. Now, Sometimes we use the definition of the very famous rhetorician there, Cicero, right? And I have that stated there. Hmm? Likelihood is what custom or opinion of human nature would say is apt to happen in one situation or be done to one kind of person. Boys will be boys, right? Huh? Okay. Okay. So it's a statement of what is likely. Huh? Okay. It's likely that boys will be boys, right? But sometimes a newspaper you read about a boy who's done the thing you expect a man to do, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, or a little girl, right? it happens, happen, right? And she, the mother, right? And then she does everything right, huh? Okay. okay. So, like, you find Shakespeare often is pretty likely to use the word it's like, you know? The, the word in, in Latin is uh, very similar to that. For likelihood. And uh, in Greek it's ikos, huh? Ikos. Which has a related word icon, right? It has a word of, of like, huh? But it's likely. Okay. So it's what custom opinion makes you dictate. Politicians say what they say to get elected, right? Yeah, so that's likely, right? You see? So you might state that, or you might simply what? Imply it, right? Mm -hmm. You know why you're saying that, it's a politician. Mm -hmm. right? so, and I expect that in two months, in the mind of my readers, right, will be the thought that politicians want to get elected, right, and they'll say things to get elected, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what they really think, right? What, the part what human nature would say? Yeah, That's yeah. But, I did, you know, uh, say fall in human nature. Right? Okay. 
give a guy an inch and I take a mile, right? right? Okay. I, I give a funny example in class there because <coughs> my friend uh, Jim, right? Huh? He was a very handsome fellow, right? He's the best conversationist I knew among any students in college. And he was handsome and he was uh, strong. He was a golden gloves boxer and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So the girl. But Jim was, was a good Catholic, right? Huh? You know? <clears throat> so, example I give the students affected with give a guy an inch and take a mile. Isn't that true, girls? And they all admit that, right? Give a guy an inch and take a mile. So, so anyway, the one story that Jim told me about was he uh, put out the girl, right? And comes back to the apartment afterwards. See? And they uh, sit on the sofa there making out of it. And uh, the girl says to Jim, you can go as far as you'd like, see? Jim says, well, he says, in that case, he says, I can go all the way home. I get <laughs> <laughs> so I said, here's an exception to the rule, give a guy an inch, to take a mile, right? You see? You see? But it's likely that the man would take advantage of the one, right? She says something like that, see? Okay? And uh, most people would... Uh, uh, that is a bit stronger than the truth in some cases, right? Okay. Um, so, likely there's a statement about what happens in human affairs, but there's always some exceptions usually, right? Huh? Okay. And that's why you lack the strength of the syllogism, right? Okay. A man will not always take advantage, you know? He's given that leeway, right? right? Okay. A politician will not always, right, speak to the elected, right? Okay. I told you, you know, some guy in American uh, history there who said, I'd rather be right than president. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't remember who his name was, so I was talking to one of the old historians of some mm -hmm. Who said that? He, he, he said, probably somebody didn't have a chance. He said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can say cynical, right? You see, you know, just a had a chance. <laughs> you know, you'd rather be president than right, huh? You see? I mean, I mean, a lot of times there's humor in this, right? But still, you know, people will take that as being like it, right? <laughs> um, now, the sign, though, is something which is tied to the senses. So you're still fairly close to the senses when you talk about signs, huh? Now, a sign is always defined as St. Augustine defined it, right? It's that which strikes the senses, right? And brings to mind something other than itself. Okay? So again, there's in thumas, right? Something in the mind when you see this, right? So if you see somebody coming out of the bar and he's kind of, you know, staggering, right? Right away you think he's what? Drunk, right? You don't see that he's drunk, you see him what? Staggering, and that's a sign that he is what? Drunk, right? Okay. Now a man might stumble, though, for other reasons, right? You know? And so is that a necessary sign of his being drunk? Huh? Okay. There could be some other physical conditions, right? Huh? My wife works with, you know, brain injured people sometimes, right? And some of these people, the, 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 the cop thinks that they're, what, drunk because they act kind of, you know, dopey and up. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's kind of an embarrassing situation, right? Because they're really not at all that. Huh? Okay. But you know, you can go down to bed at night time, you know, and kind of staggering down. <laughs> you know, you stagger to bed sometimes, you're really tired, right? Huh? I always tell a couple of stories of one of my students there who had this kind of long, you know, gritty hair like that. One day he comes into class and his hair is all neatly cut back. <laughs> so I see you change your hair. But so what happened to me? He said, he was in some kind of an automobile accident, right? And he was going to defend himself in court, right? And he went down to the courthouse in order to some preliminary thing in one of the things. And he asked the policeman there, you know, what the situation was. And they, at least when Sami plays it on the drug charges, so he's so, oh. <laughs> so right away, you know, I mean, this was a sign of placement of, of, of a disordered life, see? <laughs> I remember myself, I was driving down from Quebec, you know, 
here I slept as Monday down. And I was <laughs> driving straight through an eight, nine hour drive, more or less. See? And it was late at night, and I'm about five miles over the speed limit. See? And the state trooper stopped me and just kind of gave me a warning. See? They turned around and looked at me and said, You've been drinking. Mm -hmm. And I imagine, you know, after eight or nine hours, my eyes are a little red. And this guy put a little over the speed limit, and his eyes a little red, right? You I said, No, I have to go down to the back here. I was like, you know, not the dogs, one. Yes, yes, sir. I mean, the point is, this is a sign, you see. Okay. So, um, most of the signs which the Federation reasons will be signs that are more general than what they take them to be a sign of, right? Okay. And therefore, you don't have that necessity, right? <clears throat> okay, now in uh, example here taken from Julius Caesar's, uh, from the play Julius Caesar, Anthony is what? Going to try to convince the crowd, right, that those who assassinated Caesar did so out of envy, right, rather than out of what? Their claim that Caesar was about to make himself dictator, right? It's easy with so many. Well, listen to this part of the speech here. But Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. <laughs> if you read the whole speech, he keeps on repeating that phrase. Huh? And Brutus is an honorable man, although he's giving reasons and hints that he's not at all honorable. <laughs> and what figure of speech is that? Irony, yeah. He's saying the contrary to that, right? Yeah. Okay. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? Now that's an argument there. That's an infamy, right? It's an infamy from what? Likelihood, right? Now what is the likelihood? Is it actually stated there? See? No. The likelihood is that men who are ambitious, and ambitious to the point that they would make themselves what? dictator, right? Huh? That these men are interested in what? Themselves, enriching themselves, not in what? General. Benefiting their country, right? Okay. So the likelihood is not actually stated, but it's part of the argument. And he would take that as being in Thumas, in the mind, right, of his hearers, that they would see that, right? An ambitious man looks after number one, right? Not after his country, right? Huh? Okay. Now the second um, enthemy. When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Huh? Well, there he's stating the likelihood, right? Huh? In other words, if a man is so ambitious and he's driving to not only be successful but to be what the dictator of his of his country, right? To trample upon his his country's freedom, right? Huh? Is such a man going to be what? Worried about the poor. Yeah, is he going to be mild and pitiful and easily moved to tears? No. <clears throat> I, I quote the, the, our own saying, nice guys finish, what? Oh. Last, right? You know? See? I remember uh, reading one time a guy who was with, uh, he was like a reporter, I guess, he was with Mussolini back in the 30s, you know? And they're uh, driving along, you know? Usually his car, he usually makes to be very fast, right? And they're going through these little villages and so you know, and boom, it feels like they hit a little kid, right? Oh. And and the question is the reporters, you know, are shocked looking around and usually he says, Never look back, boom. <laughs> uh -oh. well, that's what you expect a van like that, right? Yeah. You know? You know? Don't look back, right? Yeah. Hit a kid, okay, boom, you know, let's go. You see? Mm -hmm. So it's likely that a man who who's going to seize power, right, that he's going to be somewhat what? Ruthless, right? Huh? Okay. So this is a, a second enthemy, right? Remember what the third enthemy is that he uses? Well, I, I, I don't give it here. What? I didn't hear the phrase in the yeah, crowd. yeah. You all did see how the feast of Luper fall. I thrice presented him a crown, right? And you refused it, right? Well, maybe that's an argument from what? Sign, right? His refusal of the crown, right? That's a sign. It's not ambitious, right? I offered the crown three times to him and he refused it, right? Yeah. See? <laughs> In between the parts of speech, you have the crowd down there, right? 
You really should know. To certain he was not ambitious, right? Because oh, yeah, 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 yeah. he refused the crowd, right? <laughs> see? See? That's what they could see, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He saw you. He talked to the crowd three times. <laughs> okay, she I know that sometimes the politicians say no, but you mean what? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, uh, um, and then the three there, of course, huh? He's supposed to be complete, right? Mm -hmm. Be himself, you know? This man's been enough time to, you know, seize the thing, right? So, uh, <coughs> uh, in Shakespeare's play, they're reaching the third, right? And they're kind of, he's going to seize the throne, right? And they, Buckingham is offering him the throne, and Richard is you know, refusing like to, you know, and people are telling him that he must accept, you know, and, you know, must die, you know, and so <laughs> Himself to Christ, the garden of Gethsemane, you know, you know, like he's, you know, too reluctant to, yeah. not by will, but the people's will be done. That's yeah. what I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, uh, uh, this is a not necessary sign, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. So, refusal of an honor, you could say, is a sign of lack of ambition, but not a necessary one. A sign, mm -hmm. right? Huh? Okay. So, most signs. And you have to be of that sort, right? Okay. Um. <coughs> sometimes they have a sign, you know, where they go to something universal. Aristotle gives the example of Socrates is a sign that philosophers are what, just, right? Mm. Okay. Again, that's a very weak argument, right? Okay. <coughs> Like saying Clinton is a sign you can't trust your daughter with a president, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fatness is a sign that someone is joyful or good natured, right? Huh? He gets back when you didn't be convivial, right? You tend to people will eat and so on. Huh? But these are not necessary signs. Now, the last kind of argument is the one we call syllogism. And this is the chief subject of the logic of the third act. Next time we'll be starting to study the syllogism itself. The syllogism argument, or you can say it's a speech, a speech in which some statements are laid down, another follows necessarily, because of those laid down. Okay. So it's speech in which some statements laid down, just two really, another statement follows necessarily because of those what, laid down. Okay. Now you know what speech is, huh? It's a vocal sound, right? Signifying by custom or human agreement having parts that signify by themselves, right? And in this speech, which we call syllogism, some statements are what? Laid mm -hmm. down, right? Okay? Now, that, that's where word our uses, huh? son. The thin tone, tin on huh? The Latin, they'll say, positis, huh? In English, we translate that, laid down. Huh? And Thomas gives, I think, a good explanation of this word, laid down, in the uh, commentaries on... This is the St. Paul, right? Then, where St. Paul is said to be put, right? Laid down. He says, well, you don't lay yourself down, something else lays you down. And laid down is the idea of what? Firmness, right? But also the idea of order towards something, right? Okay. So you see the statements that are laid down. It's 
reason that lays down the statements, right? And laid down implies that the statements have a certain what? Firmness, they're at rest in the mind. Right? And that they are laid down that they in order to something what? Else, right? Okay. So Thomas explains those three elements in the word laid down in another context, right? Okay. St. Paul has been laid down as an apostle, right? Okay. He's been laid down by God. He has a, God has placed him here, right? Okay. And it's a firmness, right? There, huh? mm-hmm. his position, his authority, and he has a certain task now, right? In order to certain task. Right? <clears throat> In English, you see this in some times in the same phrase in regard to the law, right? Uh, maybe your mother said something to you, but I'm going to lay down the law now, right? <laughs> okay? And you lay down the law, the law doesn't lay itself down, someone lays it down, right? <laughs> There's a firm that you say, I'm going to lay down the law, right? You know? And you expect a certain what? Behavior to follow from what's been laid down, right? Mm-hmm. So you have those three elements, right? Something lays it down. There's a firmness there, right? You know? The lay down law is a firmness there, but right? You're not going to be flipping around anymore. You know? Laying down the law now, right? Mm-hmm. So, like they see at Washington, D.C. now, they've got these machines that automatically photograph you when you drive through mm-hmm. over at the speed limit. Oh. And then you get your notice in the mail. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, eventually we'll come to that around here, too, because, you know, people would. If you do that, the shoe's not a photograph, you take your license plate and automatic, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> As to Joe, she has a machine that's going over the speed of it. It turns around and throws a can of paper over your car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the gauge says, oh, so. <laughs> cause accidents. <laughs> but I mean, this is a firmness, right? You lay down the law, right? You know, there's, uh, there's a firmness there, right? Mm-hmm. There wasn't before, huh? And it's also ordered. So it's speech in which reason, right, has firmly placed, right, some statements, right, in order to what? A conclusion, right? Okay. And these statements that are what, in a sense, uh, related to a conclusion, right? They um, have an order. And then another statement, right, which is not really a part of the syllogism, but a conclusion of it, right, an effect of it, right, is going to follow necessarily, right? Now this follows necessarily really separates the syllogism from the other three kinds of argument. If I, you know, lay it down and say that the meal at uh, this restaurant was good last week, it doesn't fall necessarily to be good this week. If I lay it down that um, every student is in black, <laughs> I mean, I mean this student is in black, this student is in black, this student is in black, therefore every student is in black, and therefore I took them one. <laughs> um, uh, it doesn't fall necessarily that every student is going to be in black, right? Okay. And again, um, Caesar refused the crown three times, it doesn't call necessarily, right? But he was not an ambitious, right? Okay. Um, but the syllogism, right? The conclusion, but follows necessarily, right? Okay. And if it follows necessarily, it doesn't mean the conclusion is necessarily what? True, right? Because if the premise is laid down, if even one of them was not necessarily true, then even a conclusion follows necessarily, it isn't necessarily what? True, right? Can okay, you see the difference, right? Just like in calculating, right? You know? If I multiply the numbers correctly, right? And without making any mistake here in the multiplication, the number that I get is not necessarily the correct number. If one of the numbers that I multiply it was only probable, right? I would be mistaken, huh? Aristotle does to add this last part in the definition of syllogism. 
because of those laid down, huh? if necessary. I often borrow Shakespeare there, you know. Just above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day. <laughs> but canst not then be false to the man, right? I know, son. Huh? Does night follow day necessarily? Yes. Yeah. But is it because of day that night follows? Day is not responsible for night. It's a third thing, right? The sun going around the earth, or maybe the earth turning on its axis. There's a cause of day and night, and of the necessary succession of one to the other, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, something could follow something else necessarily, and not be because of it. Night might follow day necessarily, if the earth necessarily turns on its axis, right? Okay. But it would not be because of day that night follows, right? You see that? Okay. So Aristotle wants to bring out by this last part of the definition of syllogism that it's because of those statements laid down that the conclusion, this other statement, follows necessarily. Okay. Is it? For statements, if, if the statements follow necessarily, would it always be because of those laid down? Or could you have statements that would follow? Well, I don't know, but I mean, what you're, I'm putting out here simply is, is um, if the phrase follows necessarily, it doesn't mean necessarily because of that, right? Okay. You might say learning necessarily follows ignorance, right? Or necessarily you perceive by ignorance, let's put it that way. <laughs> but, but the ignorance is not the cause of the learning, right? Mm -hmm. Fear of ignorance, as Shakespeare said. Mm -hmm. okay. This is bringing out the fact that these are, in some sense, the cause of the queen, right? Like the maker of them, the producer of them. And some of you want to say, you know, that syllogism is a reverse of induction. You know, induction goes in parts of the whole and syllogism reverse. But I think it's more, the syllogism is more like reproduction, right? Okay. Uh, more like the two dogs producing a third dog, right? Uh, or the two numbers producing a third number, right? Uh, Okay. So you can see why this kind of argument is going to have a great importance. And if you look at Euclid, you know, all the arguments in Euclid there are what? Syllogisms, right? Okay. <coughs> I noticed that the word syllogism there comes originally from the Greek word for rep reckoning or calculating, right? And we point out a couple of likenesses between the two. When you add, subtract, multiply, divide, you need at least two numbers to get a third number, right? And likewise, in the syllogism, you need at least, what, two statements to get a third statement. And then there's a certain, what, rigor in both, right? Okay. But notice, um, neither Aristotle nor the Greeks in general um, would try to make one art out of these two, right? The art of calculating and the art of what? Reasoning, right? Okay? There's a likeness there, right? And even the word for syllogism is borrowed from that, right? In English we sometimes do that. We say, you know, I reckon that's so, like in hillbilly language, right? <laughs> but we say, I figure that's so, right? We're thinking of, of mathematical figures, you know? Okay? But what does that add up to, right? You know? Whether we're talking about statements, right? And as a child, you learn how to add and subtract, multiply and divide more than you learn about the, the syllogism, right? So there's a certain likeness there, but Aristotle had never tried to make one art out of the two, right? But the, the mathematical logicians, they tried to 
lump these two under what they call deduction, right? <laughs> you know? And um, they don't really belong to the same art. Huh? You know? What's fundamental in the art of, of calculating is counting, right? You have to count before you have any numbers to add, subtract, multiply, or divide. Huh? What's fundamental in the art of logic is not counting, but understanding what something is. Okay? And you go back to those fundamental things, you can see that understanding what water is doesn't tell me how much water is in the glass, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding what a man is doesn't tell me how many men are in this room, huh? Mm -hmm. And vice versa, counting the men in this room, I have to be able to recognize a man in some way. It doesn't really help me to define what a man is. Right? So, um, the question, what is something, and the question, how many or how much, mm -hmm. one is not really, what, reduced to the other, right? Mm -hmm. See? By knowing what a man is, an animal with reason, then no way is the basis of my calculating how many people are here. Mm -hmm. I, have to, I don't have to be able to define man to count. Mm -hmm. I have to be able to identify him in some way, right? Mm -hmm. The physicist is always counting things to decisions doesn't know what they are. <laughs> Um, but you have to understand what a, a man is, and, or understand what an odd number is, let's say, and understand what an even number is, to understand that no odd number is even, right? And you have to understand the statements from which you, what, reason, right? So you can't really make one art out of the two. <laughs> but there's a likeness there, right? I think the moderns are deceived by the likeness, they want to make one thing called the science of deduction, right? Mm -hmm. but I think it's interesting to compare the two because there's a likeness between the two. When I get into the syllogism, I often compare it to adding and subtracting and point out the difference between adding correctly and having the correct numbers to add. And, you know, when you know, Aristotle talks about a demonstration, which is a syllogism whose conclusion is necessarily true, well, the conclusion has to follow necessarily from the premises, and the premise is actually necessarily true. And the prior and the posterior analytics are about that. Huh? The prior analytics is taking apart the argument to see if the conclusion follows necessarily from the premises. And the posterior, how do you know if the premises are necessarily true? You know? Two different things, right? And the same with numbers, right? When you're, when you're calculating your, your checkbook or something like that, I mean, that's not common for you, but checkbook will never work out, right? Anyway. But there's, there's how to get the wrong number, right? Well, either because you didn't add or subtract correctly, or because you added or subtracted the wrong numbers, right? And I, from my experience, found both things in checkbooks, right? That something was subtracted incorrectly, or maybe, you know, you wrote the number and you misread it, right? And you get the wrong number now. Okay. <laughs> So it's kind of an attempt there, in, in you know, going back to Leibniz and people like that, right, to unite the art of calculation and the art of logic, then. Logique and logistique. Not really the same art, huh? Okay. But there is a likeness between them. Okay. <clears throat> so when they do that, what are they doing? What do you say? Oh, Make, uh, making a monster. The <laughs> <laughs> fish don't follow him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You see, the art of calculating is, is one that's easier for us, right? And one where there's going to be what? less disagreement, right? I mean, if you might you come back and check it over and you'll agree with me, right? Mm -hmm. But logic is much more, much, much more difficult things, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the art of thinking is not mechanical, right? And the art of logic, as I tell the students, is not a substitute for thinking. It's a help to thinking, right? Mm -hmm. But don't think it's going to do the thinking for you, right? Mm -hmm. That's, you know, one of my colleagues said, you know, students think the computer is going to write the paper for them. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but instead of looking for something that will, what? mechanically do what has to be done 
in some cases by picking up something. Mm -hmm. That's the reference I have to Richard II there, huh? Dull, barren, unfeeling ignorance, huh? Do you know that kind of phrase? But he calls ignorance, what, barren, because it has no, what, offspring, right? But knowledge of two numbers, right, can give rise to another number, right? Knowledge of two statements, in some cases, can give rise to a, what? Another, another statement, huh? Okay. <coughs> Okay, let's... Okay, let's put the arguments here in kind of uh, four boxes, okay? <coughs> so it doesn't have one corner. And the name down in this other corner, the Lotus Soldism. I put the induction over this upper right corner, and I put example down in the lower right hand. So you've got Soldism in the upper left, and the name in the lower left, right? Induction in the upper right, and example in the lower right. That's going to take. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Would you put syllogism with induction? Or would you put syllogism with what? Infinite, right? Huh? Okay. Well, if you talk about the kind of argument it is, infamy is like the syllogism. In the syllogism, you have true universality, right? You get a kind of obvious example here. If I say, no odd number is even, right? That is true in itself, right? And then I say, let's say every three is odd. It's an odd number. Okay? Then it follows necessarily that every three is what? not even, right? Okay. Now the nth mean, right? He's a boy, right? <laughs> Therefore, he what? Acts like a boy, right? Okay. Boys will be boys, right? The proceeding from a is very universal statement, right? But is it really truly universal? Will boys always be boys? Will a boy never do the deed of a man? Sometimes they do very mature things, right? You see them praise in this paper is there some occasion, right? So it, it's like an imperfect what? syllogism, right? Mm -hmm. okay. It's a syllogism secundum quid, right? So sometimes Aristotle calls the enthymeme a syllogism, right? Other times he distinguishes the enthymeme against the syllogism. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like we were saying before, you know, you might uh, divide the boy against the man, right? Another time we'd say the boy is a man, right? Okay. The kitten is a cat, puppy is a dog. But then you might just divide the puppy against the dog, he's not a fully mature dog, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the end mean is like a syllogism, right? Um, sometimes Aristotle calls it a rhetorical syllogism, right? It's used in rhetoric, the end mean, huh? Okay. But it's not a syllogism simply speaking, huh? You don't have the complete universality of the soldiers. Okay. If every man who staggers out of the bar, right, you know, is drunk, then you have soldiers, right? This man staggers out of the bar, <laughs> okay? But if it's possible that a man might have some, what? Yeah, or some ailment in his leg, right? Okay? Then he might, what? Stumble, right, without being what, drunk, right? Mm -hmm. So it lacks the universality that you require to have the conclusion be necessarily what? So, right? Mm -hmm. You see how it resembles the syllogism, right? Okay. 
until he came to the word Intuma, it's in the mind, right? There's something, there's a word, the mind sees, right? There's not something that's sensible, singular. Now, so in terms now of likeness, huh? I'm drawing likeness there, writing likeness above the line here that separates, on the one hand, syllogism and, and enthymeme from induction example, because enthymeme is like the syllogism, right? Like the puppy is like the dog, right? Okay. Now, is example in some way like induction? Huh? Well, notice, huh? <clears throat> you asked me what restaurant should I go to tonight, huh? And I've been to restaurants A and B, and I had a wonderful meal at A, and a lousy meal at B, right? Huh? And I said, well, I had a wonderful meal at A, right? Okay. You say, well, I think I'll go to A then, right? Okay. Now, um, in a way, aren't I implying that the wonderful meal I had at A is symptomatic or emblematic <laughs> of the kind of meals you get at that restaurant, right? So it's almost like a what? That's Extremely imperfect one. induction, right? Mm -hmm. Because obviously the meal I had last week is not the meal you're going to have this week. It's not the same meal, individually, right? Mm -hmm. So how can I reason from the one that I had last week being good, right, to the one being that you're going to have this week being good, right? Well, it's because I take the good meal I had last week as somewhat indicative of the way meals are at the restaurant. As if all I don't say that because you see immediately the weakness of, of the argument, right? You know, I had a good meal last week, therefore all meals there are good, right? Mm -hmm. But I must be implying something about meals in general there in order to be able to uh, put your meal this week under that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, example is like a, uh, an inventory, what? Induction, right? Mm -hmm. Involves something of the induction. Uh, so Aristotle sometimes calls the example a rhetorical induction, huh? okay. but it's not an induction, simply speaking. There's an example there of the word, um, that way of naming, where we say sometimes the name that's common to two things is kept by one, right? one that has fully the meaning of it, right? The one that has imperfectly or defectively gets a new name, right? <coughs> it's like when I divide definition sometimes of a thing into definition of a thing and encircling, right? But encircling doesn't fully tell you what the thing is, right? What is wisdom? It's the best knowledge. I've drawn a line around this. But in all other knowledge, so I separate from all the knowledge. We didn't even told you what wisdom is, have we? It's the best knowledge, huh? Had even begun to tell you what's the knowledge of, right? So is that a definition of wisdom? Yeah. Well, I can give that and answer the question, what is wisdom? But it's every definition in the full sense. So we call it an encircling, right? Okay. You might call it definition in the what? Right. Yeah, right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So, if you classify these arguments in terms of likeness, basically, you put the enthymeme with the syllogism and example with induction, right? Yeah. Okay. And so when Aristotle is talking about the arguments used in rhetoric, he says, one well, argument is either a syllogism or induction. So the enemy must be a soldier, so the example must be a what? And that, if they're just two, right? Yeah. Okay. Like I must, I would say, you know, like a human being must be either a male or a female, right? So, boy and girl, one must be a male, one must be a female, right? The boy is a male, and the female is a girl, and the girl is a female, right? Okay. So he proceeds as if, you know. Mm -hmm. so Now, um, there's another way we might divide these arguments. And that is not in terms of likeness, but in terms of their, what, usefulness, right? Okay. 
Now, in some ways, this division, according to usefulness, is more proper to logic, because logic is not for the sake of what? Knowing these things, but for the sake of what? Mm -hmm. Using them, right? Logic is not for its own sake. Huh? Okay. Now, the syllogism and induction are useful for uh, conclusions about the universal. So induction is an argument for many singulars to the what universal, right? So you could use induction to conclude something about the universal. And the syllogism in Fort Zero can be used about the universal, right? So syllogism and induction are used in dialectic, which is reasoning to conclusions about the universal. And so in the dialogues of Plato, where Socrates is reasoning about philosophical questions, questions about the universal, he uses sometimes induction, sometimes what? Syllogism, right? Okay. Because those two arguments are useful for drawing a conclusion about the universal. The enthymeme and the example are useful for conclusions about the singular especially in human affairs, but the singular in human things. Huh? So in the rhetoric, huh, which is about persuading men about human things, Aristotle will talk about the enthymeme and the what? Example, right? And the rhetorician will use both enthymeme and example, right? Now, Aristotle points out that in political rhetoric, we use example more than the courtroom rhetoric. In courtroom rhetoric, we use the enthymeme more, right? You kind of see that, right? In political rhetoric, you're debating what to do in the future, right? Huh? In channel and in order, maybe. And so you tend to take what? The past, right? And you reason from that, right? So a lot of times in, in uh, legislation, they'll take the example of similar legislation in, in some state or in some other country, right? Mm -hmm. And the effect that that had, you know? And the reason for that, right? From one example to another one, right? Mm -hmm. Like it did in the Federalist Papers. But in the courtroom, you said, who's likely? First question is, when somebody gets murdered, who's likely to have what? Done it, right? Huh? And likelihood here is very important, right? <clears throat> but nevertheless, in both kinds of areas, you can use both. Huh? <clears throat> uh, if you want a good example of the art of rhetoric there, in a way, you can see in Shakespeare's play Othello, right? Huh? Where Iago, the villain, <laughs> is trying to persuade Othello that his wife is unfaithful, right? Now, there's absolutely no basis for this at all. Okay? But um, sometimes uh, Iago uses an enthymy, right? Sometimes he uses an example, right? Now, um, example, among other ones, uh, Desdemona, as you know, she ran off with uh, Athal, right? Without getting permission from her father, right? Huh? She deceived her father, right? Okay. That's interesting, huh? Because um, after, you know, Othello was in the service of the Venetian government, right? So they can't really squash him because of this elopement. But the last thing the father says, you know, the thought he says, she deceived me, she may deceive you. <laughs> See? Well, Yago picks up at that, right? Huh? Uh -huh. And uh, look how she deceived her father. You know, the size here, right? Uh -huh. You know, which is up to, right? You know? And so, you know. Uh -huh. So that's kind of like the example, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. She deceived her father. Uh -huh. You know? Be fair, we're doing the same thing with you, right? Uh -huh. You know, the size here. You know, the size here. But then, and there he uses likelihood, right? A likelihood is what? what opinion, custom, right? Huh? And Iago, of course, is very knowledgeable about people. So you don't understand the Venetian woman, right? You know? You know? They're very good at deceiving their husbands, right? You know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he goes on like that, see? So, she, you know, he's a Venetian woman, right? Mm -hmm. So it's likely, right, that 
she'd be a decent woman, that she would be a theft at the heart of what could be your husband, right? You see? So he's using both empathy and example, right? He uses no syllogism and no what? Induction, right? Then, you know, Iago, he, what, he, he uh, gets a hold of this precious uh, handkerchief, you know, that uh, uh, a fellow was very attached to, you know, mm-hmm. to the he'd given testimony, right? And she dropped it, you know? Mm-hmm. And he, he gets a hold of it, right? Mm-hmm. And he gives it to a man he's, like, trying to persuade him he's not paid for his wife, right? It seems like he's given him this you know, mm-hmm. handkerchief. And so so that's, that's the sign that he needs, right? <laughs> Well, it's a very weak sign, but it's another mm-hmm. one, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, if your wife gave you a ring or something, you know? Mm-hmm. To somebody else, you know, I mean, you know? Uh, so that, that's a sign of fidelity, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's almost not the ring, but I mean, something like that, something maybe it's pressure between them, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Something you gave me, you know, you know, never loses, you know, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, now this guy... That's it, you know? <laughs> it's a sign, huh? But you know, see, if, if the husband found his wedding ring, or the wedding ring that, that the wife had, on this man that he's already suspicious of because of other things said, right? I mean, the man, what, found the ring and put it on his hand. <laughs> but, you know, he, but it could be an exception, but he would take it as a sign that. This is the final confirmation of infidelity, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, in rhetoric, as Aristotle points out, rhetoric is really an offshoot you know, of um, not only logic, it's a part of using these arguments, right? Mm-hmm. But it's also an offshoot of you know, ethical and political studies because it tries to persuade even more by moving the emotions, right? And most of all, by projecting an image of yourself as believable person, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, Iago does those as well, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But here I mentioned the Antony with the example, right? He does use the Antony with the example, but he himself says that to a man as jealous as he's gotten my fellow, even the weakest proofs will seem like holy script, you know, in mm-hmm. scripture. <laughs> you know? Um, so it doesn't take much to convince a man, you know, that's why he's been unfaithful, he's already in this state of jealousy, right? Mm-hmm. But even before that, the eye is, you know, uh, giving himself uh, the image of a man who uh, understands people, mm-hmm. sees into people, right? A man who has Yahoo, a fellow's good in mind, right? A man who doesn't speak his suspicions like that, you know? And mm-hmm. All these things that would make you to the believe this man, right? You think he really has your good in mind? Yeah. You think he's a very knowledgeable man, a man who sees into people, right? Mm-hmm. A man who's slow and cautious to see his suspicions, you know? And then he rouses the emotions and he gets these. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, amphibines and examples huh, are useful for reasoning about the singular, right? Or persuading the jury, or persuading the crowd, or persuading an individual, even, right? So, we put these two together as an example, and then we put soldiers and induction together as far as their usefulness is concerned. Huh? <clears throat> and sometimes I make, uh, I don't know if I do it here or not, but I make this homely comparison to knives and forks, which are also tools, right? Yeah. And you know when you set the table, right? You put the forks on the left, right? And the knives on the right, huh? So if it's a fancy meal, you might have a dinner fork and a salad fork, right? You might have a dinner knife and a, let's say, a butter knife or something, right? Okay? So... Here they're separated by what? Likeness, right? Okay, the two forks are put together. The salad fork is like a dinner fork, right? Mm-hmm. And the little butter knife is like the bigger knife, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. But now when they put the steak down in the plate, what do you do? You grab the two forks? <laughs> you grab the two knives? <laughs> huh? No. Now the question is not likeness, but what? What's useful for getting at the steak? Mm-hmm. You grab the fork, you grab the knife, you go at it, right? Even though the knife and the fork are, what, not as like each other as the two forks are, right? Mm-hmm. See? Mm-hmm. The same thing here, right? Mm-hmm. See? See? If I'm thinking the likeness of these things, then 
So this is like that, right? But for a short bit, this has something to that. For a short bit, right? But now when we want to discuss the general question of philosophy, what do we do? We grab syllogism and induction. Okay? Now we want to persuade a fellow that is like his people, and we grab intervenes and examples. Huh? Mm-hmm. Even for his emotions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. You see? Or take example, like the biological example where we say, you know, we imitate nature, right? Huh? Okay. Now, if you're talking about uh, man, woman, boy, and girl, if you talk about them in terms of likeness, you put the boy with the what? man and the girl with the woman, right? You're not going to reproduce the person, you put the man and woman together, right? Okay? Because that's in terms of what? Usefulness, right? Not in terms of likeness, right? You see? See that idea? So I think you can kind of get a sense of how we divide these four arguments, right? We can divide them on the basis of likeness, on the basis of usefulness, and I think it's good to see both. And that's how it does both. But maybe in the final analysis, what you're interested in is usefulness of these things. Right? The likeness, though, is, is, is useful for understanding them, right? <coughs> but we want to finally say, how do we, how is Chakti going to reason? How, how is Yagur going to reason? Or how are the Federalist papers going to reason? But then we have to divide them by usefulness. So do you know another kind of argument? Aristotle talks about the example, right? <clears throat> he gives a um, uh, distinguishes three kinds of examples in the rhetoric kind. And the first kind is the historical example, right? Okay. And then he talks about the invented example. <laughs> and he talks about uh, the uh, proportional example, right? You know, proportions and like this ratios. And then he talks about the fable, right? Okay. So, um, uh, the fables of Aesop were used, right? His arguments, right? You know, the famous one, Aesop was defending a guy who had been in office for a while and made some money, graft, you know, mm-hmm. and so on, got wealthy from his office. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to replace this man, right? With somebody, and do you know the fable that uh, Aesop was supposed to have told his defense? He said there was an animal, right? I think it was a hedgehog or something, and he was crossing the stream with the rocks in it, right? He was jumping down between the rocks, right? And he fell between the rocks and got wedged in and he couldn't get out. And he started to bleed, right? Okay. Along come the, the bugs and so on, so down, start to pick his blood, right? The little animal comes along, and he sees the poor hedgehog, and he's not big enough to, to get him free from the rocks. And he says to him, well, but you want me to chase away the, the, the flies and so on, the bugs, right? He says, no, no. He says, they, they've taken all they're going to take. They're, they're filled up. Chase them away, and new bugs will come, <laughs> and do I have left, right? <laughs> he says, so, is it my client, huh? I, I, I could have gotten healthy, but he's satisfied now. <laughs> you get ready to put somebody else in, and they'll take the rest of your money. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty, pretty good defense that Aesop had, right? <clears throat> and uh, I, I used to take an example in, in class, and I, I taught some students, I would take an example that would kind of uh, strike home. You know? And uh, the 
example, you're trying to persuade somebody who's a student in college not to get married by he's in college, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not a practical thing to do, right? And uh, you might have historical example, right? <coughs> you might mention so and so, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Back a few years, how he was, you know, as a sophomore in college and he, he got married, and then the kids came and he had a job and he couldn't keep up with his college studies and he had to drop off and. You know, he never finished his college degree and so on. Well, that would be an argument, right? Uh, the first kind historical example, right? Mm -hmm. okay. But then, you know, you give maybe uh, the first kind of invented example, and I'd say, well, you know, say that nations never, what, appreciate their freedom until they've lost it, right? Mm -hmm. Nations have sometimes, you know, elected, you know, like they say, like Hitler elected, right? You know, a dictator, right? And then when they lose their freedom, then they, they realize the precious of much, right? Well, a bachelor doesn't really appreciate his freedom <laughs> until he's married, right? And this is weaker because the life is what? Uh, it's parallel, right? You see? That nations don't appreciate their freedom until they lose it, right? Bachelors don't appreciate their freedom until they lose it, right? Mm -hmm. But you can see how the nation regrets, right? Having come to this dictator, now you're going to what? <laughs> Leave your feet in, right? See? See? But no, it's that story. Invent the example of itself, so it's got to be proportional to it, right? But then you take the parable, right? <laughs> and the parable was the goose that laid the golden egg, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? You say, now, I um, you know that each day the goose lays the golden egg, right? You say, no. Well, you know the story, right? And, uh, gee, that's nice. Well, let's get all the gold, right? Let's kill the goose. And what? Now they have what? No, no. no. See, see. So you're going out on these dates, you know, with this girl. Each date is golden, right? Mm -hmm. And you say, well, now I want to have her all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody used to say, climax spoils romance, right? Mm -hmm. You know? It's not so golden, but you know? And here, so you know, how do you go over and tell it, right? Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. But, but no, that's, that's much weaker, right? But it's painful, right? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> even in a way, what the argument is a what? And uh, you know, it's like the example in a sense. Huh? You know, it's kind of an uh, invented one. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, so you can you know, place it under this in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Though in another sense, maybe not strictly speaking, an argument, right? It was saying during the Second World War there when we were trying to be friendly with the Russians, right? They made some movies in, in, in uh, Hollywood, you know, which represented society in Russia um, falsely, right? In order that, what? We would think that they're, you know, that the Soviet government and so on, you know, allows freedom of religion and so on, right? Like you have them over here, right? Then. Okay. So some things were, right, in Russia at that time, uh, that's obviously, it was an argument at all, it's very weak, right? Okay. Well, people will see a movie, you know, a historical set movie, right, in a certain period of time, and, you know, it's not really authentic, right, what things were. Huh? Is that an argument, or who would you just call that? Mm -hmm. Inducement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But because it's represented us, right, then, I remember as a, as a child there, two examples there, <laughs> the uh, next door neighbor was there. Uh, they had one son, right, Kenneth, huh? And Kenneth was the only child. And his mother died, right? Okay. And so eventually Kenneth's father decided to marry again, right? And we heard about this from the mother of both kids, my brother Rich and my brother Marcus. And so we heard that, that Kenneth was going to be getting a stepmother, right? Well, my mother overheard us at the table discussing how we're going to protect Kenneth from his stepmother. <laughs> you know, in case, you know, she is indeed and cruel, you know, like stepmothers <laughs> are. And when anyway, my mother, you know, she stopped and she explained to us, you know, that stepmothers in real life are not, you know, like the stepmothers. But why do we have that idea in our head? 
because of the fairy tales. Or things that sort, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like you know, Snow White's mother, stepmother, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the stepmothers represented in the fairy tales as being what evil and cruel and so on, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. And so, um, when uh, when is when you, you say when you're drawing a conclusion there, or he's just kind of what accepting it because it's represented there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but you can see that led us to this, right? Yeah. In the same way, you know, um, you know, uh, good Tom's cabin, this may have been a true thing, but I mean, it represented, right? Certain conditions down in the south with slavery, you know, and the splitting up of families and so on, right? Huh? Okay. So this, this is persuasive, right? Huh? But uh, is it really an argument at all, you know? That's more like custom or something. You know, it, it, it would be you know, through the ocean, right? Primarily, yeah. Um, Thomas says, Poete est in ducere et aliquad virtuosum, right? Predicentum representationum. It belongs to the poet to lead us into something virtuous for a suitable representation, right? But then Thomas how a food becomes abominable, right, if it's represented to us under the likeness of something disagreeable. You know? And I had a speculation, you know, when I was a, a, a boy, I got to hate milk. <laughs> and I remember my mother trying to get me to drink milk, trying everything, right? And, uh, you know, 50 cents a drink of milk or something, right? <laughs> get to drink milk. And uh, finally, you know, I'm sitting down to the drugstore with my milkshake, right? Which I could save my daily. You know? But I had an impression that I was sick one time and I was given milk of magnesia, oh, kind of know. disgusting thing, and that afterwards I thought of milk under the likeness of what? Milk of magnesia, right? Huh? You see? And, uh, well, if you think of it, you know, something good, you then the light is something disgusting, then it becomes what? Unattractive, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. so, I think that happens a lot with foods, right? You, know, you kind of, you know, you have a kind of irrational dislike of a food, because mm -hmm. the way you picture it, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. But it seems to be affecting the appetite there, you know? It's just it is, the art of rhetoric, they say the art of rhetoric, uh, the second means of persuasion is the way you move the emotions of the people, right? Mm -hmm. And the poet can move the emotions in the way too, right? So you can represent them. So you see that uh, good things and bad things can be represented, you know, in a way that's like, that's how they are, right? I mean, you know, Hollywood, you can see them in movies, right? The fact that things that are bad is that they were yeah. acceptable, right? You know? And, uh, so they're, they're judging by your imagination? Well, yeah, but, you, but you, your emotions primarily, right? It's, 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 uh, it's like the art of persuasion, but more like the art of persuasion in its ability to move the emotions than in its uh, argumentative aspect, huh? <clears throat> but uh, it's, it's working through the imagination too, in a sense. Huh? The false imagination. You know, C.S. Lewis there. Uh, there's a passage there that somebody quoted in one of his logic books. But uh, C.S. Lewis is going down to some part of England he'd never been before, and uh, he's. Uh, being met at the station there by an uncle or some, something like that. And they start to drive through, and C.S. Lewis is struck by the fact that the place is still different than what you imagine it. And of course, uncle's saying, what right did you have to think it was this other way? You know, this is kind of, you know, kind of a, a, of a popular reduction to logic, right? You know, mm -hmm. you know? and uh, uh, very often we imagine a place you've never been to, right? Mm -hmm. 
or we imagine, you know, uh, somebody we're going to meet that haven't met before, and they're kind of surprised when you actually what, meet them, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. See? And uh, I know my wife met some of my, my friends back home, right? You know, like Jim, the, the former boxer, you know, and, so <laughs> and the hard drinking Jim and so on. Uh, you know, kind of surprised that, you know, you know, I have friends like this, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, <coughs> I remember myself when I was in high school, I imagined what it would be like to be in college. Mm -hmm. It was big not being, I thought it was a big college, exactly. When I was in college, I imagined what it would be like to be in graduate school, and it did not be what I exactly expected, right? Mm -hmm. When I was in graduate school, I expected, I imagined what it would be like to be a teacher and a faculty, right? And that did not be the same either, right? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I think we, everybody finds that, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. That things are not the way you imagine them to be. Mm -hmm. And so you were deceived in a way by your imagination. For example, false imagination. Is that an argument? See? See? Mm -hmm. did, I, did I have an argument that, like I thought when I'd be um, on a faculty, let's say, that, that you'd be having, you know, uh, uh, intellectual conversations all the time with interesting people, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, if so and so's out in some abstruse kind of mathematics and someone else is doing economic analysis, he's going to be talking, making small talk if we happen to end up at a lunch table together or something, right, you know? So I mean, things are much different, you know. I didn't really have any reason to think that it was going to be this way, but I just thought it would be that way, you know. <laughs> um, but if you see it happen more of this, right, you know, where everybody's doing the same, you know, everybody's doing their own thing, right? Um, uh, then you tend to talk about something unintellectual, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, you constantly are imagining things to be different, right? Um, uh, then they are, right? Um, you talked to foreigner, you know, and I, I'd say I had a student in Arabia, and he used to joke with me about what the Americans imagine Arabia to be like, right? And he said, I just came in my life, he says, and so on, so on. And, uh, 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 but it's not an argument, is it? It seems to me um, that things that have something that's in effect, right? It gets you to imagine things a certain way, right? I know, you know, people who have a kind of superficial interest in history and they love historical novels or something like that, right? Because they're learning about the past or, you know, it's kind of an easy way. Well, sometimes these novels do capture something true about the past, but a lot of times they're quite uh, false, right? But you kind of imagine things to be that way, so it kind of pushes you that way, right? Mm -hmm. But say, even without that, you know, from my own experience, you know, no one, I haven't seen any <laughs> movie about graduate school or any movie about college professors, but I imagine things to be a certain way, and they'd be aren't that way. You know? Um, before we get married, they imagine married life to be a certain way. And not all of it imagine it to be, right? <laughs> it may be better, maybe worse, you know? But it's, really not the, it's not going to be the way you imagine it to be, right? And that is true about all kinds of things in life. <laughs> Yeah, so it doesn't seem to be hard at all, does it? So. It's not from statements. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's something like that in the sense that you, you put together things in your imagination, yeah. yeah. And you're probably doing it for a reason. Yeah. So whether it turns out or not, or you yeah. imagined it, uh, <laughs> might show you how far off your imaginative reason, yeah. reasoning is if you yeah. had such an animal. Well, you see, like in that story I was talking about C.S. Lewis, you know, he comes down and says, oh, I always thought this part of England was, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's not at all the way he thought, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I, I went to say 
hair of desert, I find now is not as the way I imagine it, you mm -hmm. know. There are probably a lot of things here that are, you know, not simply wool and sand. So, right? Yeah. Uh, but if you push that table, right? that's always a part of the way it's from the strict example. Huh? Okay. First, I was chairman, and I couldn't was even my schedule for logic. And then, um, now, um, let me fill that too. Okay, um, I think I got enough copies here. One, two, three, four. How many copies do you need? Two, three, four, five, six, six seven, eight, 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 two, eight, two, eight, oh, six, seven, eight. Okay. So, this is the first thing I'm still doing now, okay? <clears throat> and it's going to distinguish the three kinds of syllogism, right? One that Aristotle calls the syllogism period, and then the hypothetical syllogism and either or syllogism, okay? And I talk about the forms of the either or syllogism and the forms of the if then syllogism, okay? Because they're fairly brief, right? Okay? But uh, first we'll be finishing the form and matter of the syllogism, right? And going into those forms, okay? okay. Now, we may cover that extent, we may not, but go ahead. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now this next one here, you want to make copies again. This is the form of the simple syllogism, the regular. Aristotle just calls it syllogism, period. That's going to be involved now. Okay. So four, five, six. Seven, eight. Again, now, but maybe you shouldn't read this the next time. This will be the first one I passed out. Okay. okay. But, uh, mm -hmm. okay. And, uh, okay. <coughs> I mean, eventually we'll, we'll look at a few simple theorems in Euclid, and you'll see, like, like for example, in the uh, sixth theorem of Euclid, in the first book, that uses the, the syllogism, and he uses the hypothetical syllogism, and he uses the um, uh, Edor syllogism, right? Okay. Sometimes they call them categorical syllogism, like that, right? Categorical syllogism, the the uh, uh, hypothetical or conditional, the if then syllogism, and the disjunctive with either or syllogism, right? Okay. But even in a simple theorem like theorem six, is one of the first ones where I see it using all three, right? Um, mm -hmm. in, in, in the first uh, theorem, say in Euclid, he uses just one kind of syllogism, right? Mm -hmm. The first theorem in Euclid is, is the one where. Um, on a straight line, you're going to construct a what? Equilateral triangle. And so he takes this end as the center of a circle, and this is the radius, and he draws a circle like that, right? Okay. Then he takes this as the center of a circle, and this is the radius, and he draws another like, circle, right? Then when they cut, he draws lines from there to there, right? And he's got Equilateral, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, he's going to prove that these two lines are equal because they are what? Let's get right, yeah. the numbers here. A, B, and C. He's going to prove that A, B, and A, C are equal. And what's the status which is going to reason to that? 
and being in the uh, radii of the same circle, yeah. and yeah. all radii yeah. of the same circle are equal, yeah. right? Okay. So you have two universality there, right? All radii of the same circle are equal, right? A, B, and, and B, C are radii of the same circle, therefore they're equal, right? It's very simple, right? Okay. Then he wants to prove that A, C and uh, B, C are equal, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And it's exactly the same syllogism, right? Because they, A, C, and B, C are radii of the same circle, and radii of the same circle are equal, right? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's what Aristotle is called the syllogism period. <coughs> now, what remains to be proved? Uh, a, B, and, and C are equal. Yeah, you have to really declare everything, right? Now, how's it going to prove that A, B, C, and C? You can't prove that in the same way. And then the second statement is saying that A is so, right? Well, then necessarily you must say what? B is so, B is so right? So this form here is a syllogism, and it's obvious, huh? right? Once you understand what you're saying, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. You have to go back to something obvious because you can't prove everything, right? If you had to prove everything, you could prove nothing. Okay. Now, what about if A is so, then B is so? A is not so. Does it follow necessarily that B is not so? See, now a lot of times students will think that follows that B is not so, right? And as far as your imagination, you know, there's something which we call in philosophy false imagination, right? And false imagination is the main cause of deception on the side of the knowing powers. Huh? Now notice, huh? If A is so, then B is so, A is so, B is so. If A is so, then B is so, A is not so, then B is not so. <laughs> it, it, it's imagination, it seems to what? Exactly the same, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's false imagination, right? Mm-hmm. Now, um, how do we show that this form here is not a syllogism? Mm-hmm. Just find the examples of that contradiction. Okay. You've got to find the examples where when you, for A and B, right? Mm-hmm. Such that when you substitute them in, right? You get a false. Well, first of all, that these statements will be true, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. And you need one example where uh, B is in fact so, and one example where B is what? No. Not so, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, why do you need that, see? Well, if something followed necessarily about B, and that's what the syllogism must require, right? It's mm-hmm. in the very definition of syllogism, that the conclusion followed necessarily. If something followed necessarily about B, it would have to be always so, right? Yeah. Okay? In a sense, um, you see the connection there between necessary and always, right? And you can see that in simpler things than the syllogism. If I say that um, uh, two is necessarily half of four, right? Then two is going to be always what half of four, right? But if I say that man is necessarily, let's say, white, then if man were necessarily white, man would always be white, then. So if you produce one man who is what not white, a black man. You've shown that man is not always, right? Mm-hmm. Necessarily what? Boy. Right, yeah. He's not always so, right? Mm-hmm. He's not necessarily not white either, because you got white man, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So you need that, huh? Okay. So, can you think of examples for both, huh? So, if Socrates is a dog, then Socrates is an animal. 
Yeah? That's true, right? Because Socrates is a dog, and Socrates is an animal. Huh? And it's also true that Socrates is what? No, no, Not no. a dog. But in this case, Socrates is a what? But if Socrates is a what? Mother, I'd say. Then Socrates is a woman. True. Socrates is not a mother, but he's also not a what? Woman. Yeah. Right? So it might be that B is so, when these are true, like Socrates is an animal. It might be that B is not so, like Socrates is not a, a woman, right? Now that ain't enough. <laughs> um, for a what? Necessary. For a syllogism, yeah. Because a syllogism means that something's necessarily so, and therefore always so, right? So if it's sometimes so, sometimes not so, that isn't enough for necessity, right? If I say that man is necessarily white, and some men are white and some are not, forget about saying that man is necessarily white, huh? Yeah. You see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you can't show that it formed as a syllogism by examples. Because okay. examples wouldn't show even that it's always so, would it? Mm. You can't draw examples. No alone is necessarily so, right? Mm. In the same way with simpler things. If I say that um, numbers are necessarily even, see, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, <laughs> one bigger, infinity of examples almost, huh? <laughs> Uh, where numbers are even, right? But that doesn't show that they're always even, no matter how many I give, right? Let alone that numbers are necessarily even, right? Yeah. So you cannot show that a form um, of if then speech is a syllogism by examples, but you can show by what? Examples that is not. You see the reason for that? I can't show by examples um, that uh, uh, every two is necessarily half a four, always half a four, right? Yeah. That can't look at every two, right? Okay. If I find one two that isn't, that would be enough to just prove it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um, So you see that this then is what? Not a syllogism, right? Okay. But often people are taken in by that, huh? I'll say to the students, putting in material, I'll say, if Socrates is a mother, then Socrates is a woman. But Socrates is not a mother, therefore he's not a woman. Mm -hmm. That seems to make sense, right? Mm -hmm. Because they know that Socrates is not a mother is true. They know it's true that Socrates is not a woman, right? Mm -hmm. And is not being a mother, and is not being a woman, have something to do with each other, right? Mm -hmm. But does it follow, right? Because he's not a mother, then he's not a woman? Well, then the, the woman who, in my class, the students, you know, who are, who, you know, not mothers either, they would not be woman, right? <laughs> Very strange conclusion, right? Um, But if you give this, you know, with statements they know are true. If Socrates is a mother, then he's a woman. Socrates is not a mother. Socrates is not a woman. They'll sometimes think it follows, right? Okay. Aristotle compares that, um, well, leave this that down. So you see the point? Okay. Now, this form up here, if A is so, then B is so. B is so. This is the one that deceives people the most. Huh? Most people on the first sight will think that what? It follows that what? Yeah. And in the book called The Poetics, Aristotle says this is the way that Homer taught the other poets how to tell a what? Good lie, right? Uh -huh. okay. And we take that expected consequence being true is a sign, right? Mm -hmm. Of the truth of what went out. 
before, right? If he's losing the argument, then you'll get angry. Well, that sounds quite probable, right? He got angry, he must therefore what? Be losing the argument, right? We could get angry for more than one reason, for instance. Mm -hmm. Not because you're losing the argument, but because the other guy is just, you know, not seeing the obvious or denying the obvious or, you know, confusing the issue or something, right? Many reasons to get angry at somebody besides the, the fact that you might be losing the argument, right? Yeah. But often we'll, we'll do that, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, no, it's, uh, you have to disprove this to show that it's invalid, it's not a syllogism. You have to do that again through examples, right? Okay. I know it's, huh? If this number is 2, then this number is half to 4. This number is half to 4, therefore this number is what? Uh, Two. Seems like a good arm, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. okay. Now, in terms of the matter there, you could say what? Well, half of four and two are convertible, right? Half of four is a property in the strict sense. It belongs only to two, to every two and always. So if this number is two, this number is half of four, if this number is half of four, it's two. And you go back to this formula, right? <laughs> But if you just consider the form itself, this would follow from that, and yet that not be so. And there's infinity of examples. But any kind of example B is more general. And A is like what species, let's say, B is a genus. If this is a dog, this is an animal. This is an animal, therefore this is a dog. Okay. We got this pet at home, Tabitha, who's a cat, or she's a cat. <laughs> if Tabitha is a dog, then Tabitha is an animal. True. Tabitha is an animal. True. Therefore, Tabitha is a dog? Mm -hmm. No. no. Okay. So, um, it might be that A is so. If Tabitha is a cat, Tabitha is an animal. Tabitha is an animal. And Tabitha is a cat. Okay? If Tabitha is a dog, Tabitha is an animal. True. Tabitha is an animal. Tabitha is not a dog. So A might be so, it might not be so, when these are what? True, right? Mm -hmm. I've given an example of each. So there's nothing that is always true when those premises are true. You can't say that B is always so, you can't say that B is, excuse me, that A is always so, you can't always say that A is not so, right? Mm -hmm. Tabitha is a cat, but Tabitha is not a dog, right? And if nothing is always so, then nothing is what? Necessarily so, right? And therefore you don't have a syllogism because syllogism means something necessarily so, as it is, right? Now what about this fourth form here? If A is so, then B is so. B is not so, right? Does anything follow necessarily about A? It's not so clear as up here. So, we show that A is not so, necessarily, through the more obvious case. You throw what is not obvious to what is obvious, right? And we say that uh, either A is so or A is not so, right? Now, if A were so by the first case, then B would have to be so, right? Necessarily. But you're given that B is not so, right? So, the statement A is so, B is not so, and A is so. Those three statements, are they compatible? No. Because by the first case, statement one and statement three contradict statement one, two. So you can't hold on to those three statements, can you? Mm. It's just like in calculating, you know, if I say that the, the, uh, the length, let's say, is 10, and the width is 2, and the area is, let's say, 40, you say, I don't know, 
which of those numbers is wrong. <laughs> but they can't all be right, right? You know? Because two of them would contradict the what? Third. Two times ten would not be forty, or forty divided by two would not be ten, right? Okay? So statement one, if A is so, then B is so, and statement A is so, they necessarily, by the first case, the conclusion B is so, which goes against B is not so. So if you're given that B is not so to start with, that's laid down. Mm -hmm. Then B is so must be eliminated, right? Mm -hmm. You're also given that if A is so, then B is so. So you can't hold on to what? Okay. A is so. You must reject that, and therefore you must say that A is not so. Either A is or not so. You see that? Okay. And often we reason this way, right? We'll, we'll take a... Uh, a statement we know is so, and a statement that is false, and at least is something we know is false, and then we know that the, the one statement was unknown must be what? False, right? So if you're given as true, if A is so, then B is so, you're given that B is not so, then A is so could not also be true. Because A is so, and the if-then statement would have led to B is so, but that's false. So the cause of the false would have to be that A is so. Okay. You see that then? Okay. So there's two forms of if-then speech that are syllogisms and two that are what? Not. Huh? Okay. And so um, you have to become very familiar with those four forms and you're going to find them repeated, right? Infinity of times. Huh? If you read the first book of uh, natural hearing uh, that they call the physics of Aristotle, and he examines the argument of what? Melesis, right? And he argues thus. If being had a beginning, then being had an end. If being doesn't have a beginning, therefore it doesn't have an end. <laughs> this is the way Melesis argues, right? If being had a beginning, then it has an end. There's some probability of that. But it doesn't have a beginning, therefore it has one. <laughs> He's using this form, which is not a what, syllogism. Mm -hmm. His conclusion doesn't follow, right? Because mm -hmm. matter is bad to ourselves. <laughs> but either defect is enough to, you know, to overcome somebody's argument, right? Mm -hmm. Either his conclusion doesn't follow, or the premises it uses aren't true or even probable, right? And at least it's eventually shown to have both defects, right? <laughs> Poor pieces. <laughs> but it shows the need for logic, right? Huh? Philosophers need logic, right? It's the last part of philosophy to be discovered, right? But uh, they begin to see the need for it this time or not. Okay. Now, um, when I first explain this, and, and most times I go just using the letters A and B there, right? Huh? Now, it might be if you wanted to um, follow the order of letters and the order of what? Uh, the antecedent and consequent, right? Mm -hmm. Then you could state this a little different, right? You could say reason looks before and after, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a simple state which we'll call B. If you have a simple statement called B, if you want to prove that B is so by an if-then syllogism, right, would you look before B or after B? Would you look for some statement that comes before B that B follows upon, right? Like A. Or would you look after B for a statement that follows upon it? C. Well, if you wanted to establish that B is so, you'd look before, right? You'd have something from which B follows, right? Now, if you knew or could prove that A is in fact so, then you could, what, syllogize that, what, B is so, right? Okay? If you want to overthrow B, right, we're going to try to overthrow B, then you want to look for something that follows upon B, right? Okay? So you look after B, say, if B is so, then C 
is so, right? Now, if you know that C is not so, or you can prove that C is not so, right? Then you can syllogize that B is not so, right? Okay. And you can see how well the, the phrase of, of uh, Shakespeare fits this, right? Looking before and after, right? Notice, you know, the kind of obvious before and afters in the syllogism. The premises are before the conclusion, right? That's one before and after, obviously. Okay, so the word premise indicates that pre, before. But then in the if-then statement, you have a before and after. Because the antecedent is before the what? Consequent, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But then you see that you look before if you want to establish a statement. You look after if you want to what? Or fulfill it, right? Mm -hmm. And so to represent the fact that I'm looking before and after B, I use A for what is before B and C for what is after, right? Then. Okay? Well, so that's to just tie it up with uh, where you look, then. Okay? So these are the two ways you can, what? Reason, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Now, Let's take an example of this, huh? From Aristotle in the metaphysics there, he says that uh, Socrates was trying to syllogize. Huh? And he gives us a sign that Socrates is trying to syllogize, that Socrates is trying to define. And definition is very much the beginning of syllogism, especially what we call the syllogism period, right? The, Simple categorical syllogism. Now, if you look at the dialogue called the Mino, in the Mino, Socrates is asked by Mino in the beginning of the dialogue, can virtue be taught, right? And Socrates says, I don't know. Furthermore, I don't even know what virtue is, right? Furthermore, I've never met anybody who does know what virtue is. And Mino says, Well, I know what virtue is, right? Socrates says, well, come tell me what it is then, right? And so Mino tries to say what virtue is. At first he gives examples, and Socrates says, well, you're not really telling me what virtue is, right? If I ask you what water is, you say, well, there's the rain, and there's the lake, and there's the faucet, and so on. You know, you give me examples, but not telling me what water really is. So then finally Mino tries to say what virtue is, and Socrates points out that his definition of virtue doesn't even separate the good man from the bad man. <laughs> so by the end of that first conversation, which is an examination conversation, it's clear that Mino doesn't know what virtue is. Then begins the second part of the dialogue, where Socrates says, Now, um, uh, let's put our two heads together and find out if we can what virtue is, right? And at that point, Mino gives the sophistical objection. You can't look for what you don't know. Mm -hmm. okay. Then Socrates tries to show how you can, <laughs> by trying to show that learning is what? In a way, recalling what you do already know. Right? Okay. He has some difficulties there, too, because on close examination, it may appear that the slave boy is not really recalling how to double square, but coming to know it through things he already knows. But coming to know it for the first time, right? Mm -hmm. and in fact, he's so far from recalling it in the beginning that he's actually mistaken as to how it's done, right? Mm -hmm. okay. But then, in the third part of the dialogue, uh, Mino still wants to know whether virtue can be taught, right? Even though they don't know what virtue it is. And uh, he's not willing to discuss what virtue is, right? My brother Mark says, what do you do with a guy like that, huh? <laughs> You're going to find people in daily life, you know, in the academic world, who are just like me, you know, right? They want to know this, but you have to know this before you can know that. And you explain that, and then you show them that they don't know this, that they have to know beforehand. Okay, okay, okay. But I, I still want to know this. <laughs> right? It's like the student came to me and he said, uh, uh, I've heard this Pythagorean theorem, you know. And I said, well, I know the Pythagorean theorem. I said, well, all I know is Euclid's proof in Proposition 47. Now, we've got to go through 46 
I read your toilet. Oh, I don't do that. 46, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'm sorry, you know? You know? That's it. That's illogical, right? But Socrates says, well, if you, you know, twist my arm, right? I'll, at least I'll discuss it, right? Huh? But since we don't really know very well what virtue is, let's look on both sides and see if there's any reason to think that virtue can be taught, right? Any reason to think that virtue cannot be taught, right? So you're going to proceed dialectically, right? Reasoning from probable opinions, right? Even to contradictory conclusions. Now the demonstrator never does that because he knows what things are. But the dialectician is on the way to knowing what things are. Right? So, uh, the dialectician very often and naturally adopts one of these two forms, right? Okay? It's sort of appropriate to his matter, right? Okay? So, Socrates first reasons that virtue can be taught and he uses what? This form here. And then he reasons that virtue cannot be taught and he uses this form here, right? The other two forms that we saw were not syllogisms, he doesn't what, use, right? Okay. So, he says, without knowing, he says, what virtue is, what sort of a thing would virtue have to be in order to be taught? Well, it seems that we teach what we know, right? Okay. So, if virtue is knowledge, then it seems that it can be taught, right? Okay. And that's not saying that, in fact, virtue is knowledge. It's not saying that, in fact, virtue can be taught, but it's saying if it is knowledge, then it seems it could be taught as other forms of knowledge, right? Okay? So, if virtue is knowledge, then it can be taught. Now, that statement there is a statement that seems to be kind of obvious on the very surface, right? Okay. It's knowledge that is taught, right? Okay, so virtue is knowledge that can be taught. So the question is, is virtue knowledge or not, right? Okay. Now, uh, Socrates is going to eventually say, well, there's some reason to think that virtue is knowledge, right? But he's going to have to show that or back that statement up by a, an argument, right? The first statement is kind of stand by itself, right? Okay. Now, you're eventually going to give a reason for thinking that virtue is knowledge. If you can give a reason for thinking that virtue is knowledge, which is taken a fact, then you can syllogize that virtue what? Can be taught. Yeah. Yeah. I can put virtue up in the same hit. Okay. Therefore, virtue can be taught. Now, um, a rule you have to do when you're examining somebody's reasoning, very often we start from their main conclusion, right? Mm -hmm. And then we see the statements that are next to <laughs> the main conclusion, huh? At these two statements here lead up to the main conclusion. Now, sometimes one, sometimes both of those statements are in need of what? Some proof or manifestation, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, the if then is pretty clear because people know that virtue, that knowledge is something that you can teach, right? Mm -hmm. So it seems right away uh, acceptable to say that a virtue is knowledge then can be taught. But Socrates has to give some kind of reason to think that virtue is knowledge, right? Okay. And he uses, it seems, you know, um, what we'll call the syllogism period, right? Then, to say that something like this, to back it up, to say, uh, to take this kind of a, at least a probable statement, huh? that virtue directs us to good things, right? Okay, by right. vice leads us to what? Bad things. Huh? That's something you might accept on the surface, right? Virtue directs us to good things. 
It would also seem to be probable that it's some kind of knowledge that directs us to good things, right? It's knowledge that directs you, right? To good things. So, what directs us to good things is knowledge, right? Medical art is a form of knowledge that directs us to good things like health, right? And economics directs us to wealth, the military art to victory, and so on, right? Okay? So, at least this probability here, right? That what directs us to good things is knowledge, and it also seems probable that virtue directs us to good things, right? We all think of that. Therefore, virtue is knowledge, right? Okay? And that's another kind of syllogism backing up the, what, second premise of the main or chief syllogism, right? The main or chief syllogism is the one whose conclusion is the main conclusion, right? And then the backup syllogism, they call it the pro-syllogism sometimes, but it's backing up the second premise, right? Okay. And uh, sometimes you have to back up one of the premises in the second syllogism, right? Okay. But here, both statements seem to have some probability, right? Okay. So notice what Socrates is doing. He's looking before the statement virtue can be taught, right? Mm -hmm. And what sort of thing uh, w w w about virtue from which it would follow that it could be taught, right? He said, well, it seems obviously to be a connection between knowledge and what? Teaching, right? Mm -hmm. okay. um, we teach what we know, right? Okay. When we teach something, it's a sign we know something about it. What we're teaching, right? Okay. Then Socrates syllogizes on the opposite side. Huh? Okay. Now, here he has an if-then statement, which is, I think, somewhat weaker than the if-then statement in the first argument. But nevertheless, one, if you stop and think about it, has some what? Probability. Probability, right? He's saying if virtue can be taught, right? Then, there are teachers of it. Okay? Okay? Now, why does that seem reasonable, right? Well, we modern dummies, we have you know, kind of a very narrow understanding of virtue, right? Huh? But the Greeks would say, well, wow, look, uh, the most obvious virtue is what? Courage, right? Okay. In fact, the word virtue is, you know, sometimes identified almost with courage. Huh? Virtue is a Latin word meaning what? Manhood, right? <laughs> okay. And the Greek word art is like that. But this, first of all, is a sense of courage, huh? Now, notice, huh? if the uh, citizens of the city are not courageous, they're going to, what, be unable to defend the city, the city will be, what, taken by enemies, right? What do they do? They'll kill the men, and if they don't kill the wife and children, women and children, they'll enslave them, right? This is a horrible thing, right, to have the city, what? Yeah. So, Courage is extremely necessary for the good of the city, right? So, if virtue can be taught, you can be sure that there will be people what? Teaching it, right? That makes sense, right? Okay. And temperance and justice, huh? How can men live together without being temperate, right? Huh? If a man goes around breathing his neighbor's wife or his neighbor's daughter, right? Then have turn around the city, right? Huh? If men go around robbing from each other and so on, and stealing from each other, then they have chaos in the city, right? Yeah. Okay. So it seems that, you know, things like justice and so on can be taught, they would surely be what? Taught, right? Okay. Now, the second premise would be, but there are no teachers, huh? Of virtue. Now, 
how does um, Socrates in the conversation with Mino and so on, and Anytus gets in there and gets very angry with Socrates. <laughs> He's one of the guys who brings the uh, courtroom hearing against Socrates, huh? Okay. Well, when they discuss are there teachers of virtue, there are two groups of men that are um, possible candidates for teachers of virtue, right? And one is those men called Sophists, right? Who are going around in Greece, right? But they already have a somewhat unsavory reputation, right? Especially to the nobility like Mino and Anicus and so on, right? So in the conversation with Mino, Minos would, would deny that the Sophists really teach virtue, right? Okay. Socrates maybe too, but for other reasons, huh? Okay. Um, but what about the great men of Athens? Right? Well, now the great men of Athens were known for their virtue, for being courageous men and being just men and so on. And it seems that if these things could be taught, they should surely have taught their sons, right? But here's great men of Athens who were courageous and their sons were cowards, right? Here's a great man of Athens who was just and his son is a what? Thief, right? So if I am a, a sober man, I don't want my son to be a drunkard, right? If I am a just man, I don't want my son to be uh, a thief. If I am a courageous man, I don't want my son to be a coward, right? So it seems that if these could be taught, these men would have had their sons taught these, right? But here are these great men that taught their sons how to ride a horse, right? Then teach them how to be just. They hired somebody to teach him how to ride a horse, but didn't hire anybody to teach him to be just. Is it because it's more important to be able to ride a horse than to be just? It's more important to uh, ride a horse than to be courageous? No. So it seems that there are no what? Teachers of it, right? Okay. And um, like I might say, you know, I can name the first teacher that I had for my children of the piano and the second teacher who taught them piano, right? Now, if you ask me, and who did you hire to teach your children courage or temperance? Gee, yeah, I didn't hire anybody to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can hire somebody to teach my children to play the piano. But is it more important they play the piano than they be just and temperate and courageous, huh? Well, why did I pay money for a piano teacher and not a teacher of justice? Well, it seems like there's no, what, such teachers, right? Okay? So there's a certain probability, at least to that statement, that there are no teachers of virtue. Now, I might mention that um, in the, uh, I guess it's in the Protagoras, right? There you see a little bit the other side, right, of that. Huh? And uh, I think Protagoras says, you know, um, well, it's like, who taught you Greek? Who taught you English, right? So I could name maybe the first man I had as a teacher in French, but I can't read in, in English, right? Who taught me English? <laughs> well, to some extent, it was my mother, to some extent, my father, to some extent, my older brothers, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. And it was kind of diffused, right? Okay. And to some extent, my mother taught me justice, and my father taught me justice, and so on, right? Okay. But it's not, you know, like you go out and get somebody, right? There are, in a sense, teachers, right? Huh? Okay. But Socrates here, in this dialogue, it just brings out the way in which there seems to be you no know, teachers, right? I had no teacher of justice for my children, only the piano. Is it because I, Berkowitz, think that it's more important to play the piano than to be just? <laughs> no, no, I, I don't think that. And I think it's important that my children be just. But why didn't I hire anybody? Apparently there isn't anybody. Okay. So now you're saying if A is so, or the, you use the second way to say, if B is so, then C is so, but C is not so, Therefore, what? He is not so. Okay. So in the one case, you're affirming the antecedent and then affirming the consequent. In the other case, you're denying the consequent and therefore denying the antecedent, right? But you can't do the other two ways, right? You can't um, affirm the uh, deny the antecedent and necessarily deny the what? Consequent, right? I'm starting to say, well, what about this, you know? 
If this number is 2, then this number is half of 4. This number is not 2, therefore it's not half of 4. Well, you might say that, right? Because you realize that 2 and half of 4 are what? Convertible, right? Mm -hmm. But from the form, it isn't necessarily so. Right? Mm -hmm. um, if I'm a dog, I'm an animal. I'm not a dog, therefore I'm not an animal. No, it isn't necessarily so, right? Um, and likewise, you can't reason from the what, affirmation of the consequent to the affirmation of the what, antecedent. Huh? Now, materially speaking, on the two most common examples, maybe, are where something in the consequence is more general than the antecedent, right? Okay. Or where the consequent is an effect, right, of a cause, but there are many, what, possible causes, right? So, example I always give in classes, you say, if Berkowitz dropped dead last night, you'll be absent from class today. He's absent from class today. Is there for you dropped dead? I say, that's wishful thinking, isn't it? <laughs> but it's not logical thinking. <laughs> you see? Now, in the experimental sciences, see, how do they confirm, or test for that matter, a um, hypothesis, right? Well, they say, if my hypothesis is correct, then such and such will take place, right? They make some kind of prediction of the sort, right? And if the prediction comes true, does that prove necessarily that the hypothesis is correct? No. He's arguing the form I gave there, right? If Perkins dropped dead last night, he'd be absent from class, right? Let's wait and see if he's absent from class. Ah, he is absent from class, right? See? But that same conclusion could follow, that same effect could follow from his car breaking down like it did the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't get up here, right? And so, okay. So you can't know that it's necessarily that one because it came about, right? Now Einstein in the, uh, he said that Newtonian physics, he said, predicted so many things that came true that the scientists began to think it must, what? Must be true, right? But from the very form of the confirmation, it never follows what? Necessarily that it is so, right? And Newtonian physics was kind of remarkable. The one that always sticks in my mind was they say that when they were examining more closely the paths of the planets that they knew about, and the paths they followed weren't exactly what they should follow from Newtonian physics. Yet Newtonian physics had been so successful, they said there must be what? other planets we don't know about that interfering with the known planets. Huh? Uh -huh. And the mathematics is so exact they could predict where those planets would be, right? Uh -huh. And sure enough, that's where they were. Mm -hmm. So by the time, uh, or before Einstein, here's the relativity, some of the physicists said this must be true, right? And then Einstein, with the theories of relativity, showed he could predict the same things that Newton predicted with a different theory. Mm -hmm. And in fact, predicts some things that Newton could not predict, right? And then he says it became crystal clear that we never know here, right? No in the sense of being certain, right? You know, that a scientific theory is, as he says, a system of guesses, right? But Pierre, du I mean, uh, Claude Bernard, even in the 19th century, the, when the fathers of modern physiology had said that doubt is always intrinsic to experimental method, right? And that a hypothesis, no matter how many times it's been tested, can always be what? Tested again, right? Okay. I mean, it always be you know, the most uh, possible thing to do at this point, right? But I mean, it might possibly what? Be contradicted, right? Mm -hmm. Now notice, the more things you predict um, that come true, the greater probability, you might say, to hypothesis. Just like an induction, right? The more frogs you find with a pre-chambered heart, the more probable it becomes that all frogs have pre-chambered hearts, right? But it never follows what? Necessarily, right? Okay. But notice there's more rigor in rejecting an hypothesis, right? Because there he's saying, if my hypothesis is correct, there will be an eclipse of the sun at 10 o'clock this morning. There's no eclipse at 10 o'clock. 
they seem to have the form of the syllogism. Okay? So it seems unfair, right? <laughs> but there's more rigor there in the what, rejection of a hypothesis uh, than there is in the what, confirmation, right? If what you predict by the hypothesis doesn't come true, then you say, well, the hypothesis can't be true, right? But if what you predict comes true, well, maybe your hypothesis is correct. But <laughs> maybe. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> so there's a certain uh, uh, weakness there in science, right? Huh? Yeah. You know? And as Einstein says, on the um, the scientific hypothesis, he maintains it's freely imagined, right? Huh? It's not by by reasoning that the scientist arrives at his hypothesis. He compares it to writing a novel, in fact, in one place. <laughs> and uh, um, really crazy kinds of fiction that Einstein was reading at the time. He invented the theory of relativity, I wonder. <laughs> So, the, the fact that it's freely imagined means that it has no justification until it's been tested, right? But when it's tested and, and confirmed in its predictions, right, it's still, what, not sure, right? But, but nevertheless, you can say this is better.